Hi, Mac. Can we get some yo's? Hello. You on break right now? Cool. I'm live really early today. I have the day off tomorrow? That's cool. Wait, having a Tuesday off? That's kind of an L, I'll be honest. Also, if you guys want a sneak peek of what we're doing today, I posted on my Twitter. But, like, I kind of had to hide everything because I don't want AI to scalp it. It's also on my uh, Twitch story. I'm going to be lurking. Hi, Chip. Hope you're doing well. I have Tuesdays and Thursdays off. That sucks. Out of sight and out of reach. Past all the moon. But may the stars align. So I'm listening to my own music. Um, Vibe Watchers, I am also removing music on this channel too. I'm sorry, but my art stream VODs keep getting claimed on YouTube. So Vibe Watchers, just listen to your favorite tunes and it'll be the same. My stretch working from Friday to Monday has been exhausting. I think it should be illegal to like not have two days off in a row. Because if you think about it, what if they schedule for like a close open or like an open close in the day before and after? Like, it's so dumb. When Peason becomes president, guys, since Biden dropped, I'm going to join the race. <laughs> Wait, this is my uh, this is my business account. I can't be talking about politics. <laughs> may the stars align. I did a close open, but I was doing a favor for somebody else. Oh, that's really nice. They should like get you ice cream in like a friendly way, not a date. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done with my pose. <laughs> I showed you how to fly, but you made me. It didn't work. They do get me food sometimes? Aww. Aww. I think the biggest thing that I miss from working a real job is like the sense of like community and like the friendships you have at work. Because, yeah, you're kind of forced to be with each other, but still fun. Also, I just now remembered I can add my emotes to my Twitch stories. It's kind of cool. Okay, I posted on my main channel story. Hopefully, we'll get more chatters today. Two of my work besties left, and one is getting ready to leave. You know what? I'll say it since they left. You're not your real friends. Or they're not. Not you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, face cam on. In. In. Three, two, one. Yo. Wait, it's not working. Why isn't it working? I'm fixing it. I'm fixing the mic. Oh, that's why. Look, I'm talking. Ain't no way. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon. Hope everyone is doing well today. It is 9.13 on Monday, July 22nd. It's been a while since we've been live on this channel. Last time we were live was to make a painting. And I did say the next time you guys would see me on this channel was for the upcoming art drop, which is what we're working on, to get on to, today. <laughs> I said to get. <laughs> also, I said this earlier, if you're watching the VOD. The music should be removed. If not, I'm going to be upset. 
I think I did it right. Uh, guys, click the follow button right now, and I'll say thank you. I'm not even kidding. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to, like, get in the habit of using that timer when I see it in chat. I think it's every 15 minutes. Because since I don't have to run ads on this channel, I just don't look at my uptime anymore. I only look at chat and my viewer count. Guys, we're at a million. I'm not even kidding. Okay, I am kidding. So, the plan is simple. We're working on stamps. If you watched... So... I said in the past that I don't want my art on social media. I'm still keeping up with that for the most part. I'm fine with streaming myself doing art. I'm fine with like posting on my stories because those are temporary. It's not like somebody can use the Wayback Machine and like look an I IG story up, right? I mean, they can't, right? <laughs> Wait, I, surely they can. Anyway, so if you saw my Twitch story on my main channel, Peace and Underscore 17, you kind of know what we're doing today. Also... I'm using the new camera. This is the camera my sister got. As you can see, the frame rate is not good. <laughs> I don't... Because this camera, it's a Sony... Sony... It's a Sony... Sorry. Sony ZV-E10. I got the one that has the uh, un or detachable lens. It's the 1650 lens. Uh, what's wrong with your camera? It's not wrong. I just need to fiddle with the settings more. Because, like, see? It's not, like, in super real time. Like, even if I'm outputting at the proper frame rate, it's not as, like, clean as my regular, my normal Sony A4, A6400. It's because this camera is capable of USB-C streaming. So I don't use a capture card for this camera. But the problem is, a USB-C is not designed for input or output video. So, yes, it can do it, but it's not like the fullest capacity or cap capability. So, next time we try this camera, maybe we'll use like a the capture card. But my sister did say, because I used this camera for the chess stream on Saturday. It was my first time using it for stream. And my sister was like, you didn't break it? I'm like, no, I'm not stupid. So she's like, oh, you can use it whenever you want. So I'm like, W. So for the main channel, when we do calligraphy like the end of stream, I can probably use this camera. Yeah, it's more crisp. It's pretty. It's a lot more clear. I do have to fiddle with the aperture a little bit. But pretty good. Yeah, W sister. Remember I gave her the $400 Best Buy gift card to buy this camera? Okay, the autofocus is pretty good. Because I have... um. Manual aperture, manual ISO, but uh, automatic focus. Okay. Boys, the plan is simple. <laughs> okay. I need to hide this. Today, we're going to be, we, I mean me, I'm going to be working on finishing stamp carvings for this upcoming launch on Friday. Now, I did spoil a little bit. I did say my goal for June or July was to have paintings. I kind of want to pause on paintings because in order for me to ship mini paintings, I'd have to get new packaging. So it's kind of like, I'll pause on that for now because the budget is like $5. So I was like, shoot, I'll do stamps because those are easier to ship. I can ship it in an envelope and I don't have to like pay for shipping or tracking. I just have to put stamps on it. So... Yeah, your painting should arrive by Monday. It actually processed pretty quickly. I think it's in your state right now. I checked this morning. I'm not going to leak, but it traveled quickly. I'm surprised because I sent it out on Friday. But I I, I know somebody who works for um, shipping. And I will not confirm nor deny. But, uh, you know, wait, no, I can't. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> I ship with USPS, so like the National Postal Service, and even if they don't deliver on Sunday, the people who load the trucks and stuff still work on Sundays. They just get like more pay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, if you read the title, the theme for this week's drop, the first drop in a year on the Peace and Art website. Guys, bookmark the website right now. If you have it, do it. Also, my camera is super zoomed in, just so we can see the carving. You might have seen it a little bit. Scalpers do not screenshot. So this is a rubber stamp. I've never made these on stream. Oh wait, no. I think I did stamps for my birthday stream this year. I think I did. 
Or maybe it was my subathon. Anyway, so it's a rubber block stamp. Whenever you see in the art world, it could be called a lino print. Um, that's just kind of like the more historical name for it. But a lino print can use either all purpose ink or like um, paint. You can use more heavy pigmented ink. This is uh, liquid based. So it's like very thin, but you can get inks that are more opaque. They use like actual thicker pigment. I'm going to be using this. So this is the one I did yesterday. This took about an hour and a half. And I, I did post it on my story yesterday. And this is it inked. Here, I'll, I'll get a different angle. There we go. Scalpers do not screenshot. Look how clean this is. This press or this inking is with no touch-ups. The only like kind of flaw I see is the line is a bit thick here in this corner. This line on the bottom is really thick, but that's because we'll explain it more when I actually carve today. There's like a, a method to it to get super clean line work, but that's pretty fucking clean. Yes, I swore on my business account. And I, I haven't like carved carved in a while. But this is my first ever stamp that I've carved that is used in original illustration. I used to carve stamps all the time when I was younger. Our family did something called letterboxing. It's like geocaching, but instead of getting little trinkets, you the person hides a stamp and then you stamp the image of the stamp when you're out hiking. So this is the first stamp I've like real stamp that I've carved that is my own design, like ever. And when I finished, I was so proud of it. I was really happy. So this stamp is 2.5 by 3.5. Let's get a ruler. A little bit more than 2.5. <laughs> and then exactly 3.5. So pretty clean. I made this edge a little wider. Oh well. So these stamps will be the size of a standard like baseball trading card. So I have sleeves. Now, I used to do artist trading cards or ATCs. I'm just going to cut this one out so we can verify that it does fit in the sleeve. I used to do ATCs like a few years ago, but I decided to stop because I also deactivated my account. Because, you know, I don't want randos online knowing my address anymore. <laughs> so I stopped. Um, if you want to like just do art casually, doing ATCs is a really good way to start. A lot of people who do ATC aren't necessarily like super skilled, you could say. Um, so for casual artists, right? A lot of mixed media, a lot of illustration you can do. The website I used was... Um... Wait, I'm not going to say actually. <laughs> but I want somebody to use the Wayback Machine. But it was a different username. So this is how big it would be in real life compared to my hand. I have small hands. Like, I have small hands, but they're thick. Let's see, does it fit? Uh-oh. Yo, it fits! There we go. So if you order this, it'll come in the sleeve, in an envelope, and then I'll put a little baggie. This was on just regular copy paper. You can see how you can see the ink through. When I actually prep these for sale, we might have time to test this today, actually, depending on how fast I carve, because we got three stamps to carve today. I will either be using Bristol just drawing paper. It's kind of thick. It's like cardstock, but it has a heavier weight, so it's a bit thicker. And then I also found some hot press watercolor paper in my closet. Now, I complained before that I bought cold press water paper in bulk, forgetting that cold press paper is textured. To demonstrate, see how the grains on this paper are huge? Stamping would not work on this paper, but I had hot press. Look how smooth that is. 
So later, when we're done carving, we can test out different types of paper. And then also, I have printouts. Because I what I did, we'll go through the process later. We'll also go through and like test different color palettes for whenever it's inked. Because I will be selling just regular black and white ink print or black and white prints. And then also colored versions. So that is the plan for today. Um, just to go over my process a little bit, I will be doing a more in-depth blog post that will be up on Friday, going over and documenting all this process. So what I did first was research about stained glass. Um, I read books. I will be doing more pieces that are themed around stained glass in the future because I think the theme itself is really cool. So first, I sketched and I drew. This iris looks pretty good. This is the iris used in the first carving, which I think is the best illustration I did. So in this series, it has four different prints, all 2.5 by 3.5 of floral stained glass. A very common stained glass image you'll see is a rose, classic, you know, Beauty and the Beast type beat. I also did a tulip, something more simple than a daisy. It was really cool because I did all these sketches in a day. I did this one yesterday just to like touch it up a little bit. Um, you can see when I did my sketches, I was testing out different backgrounds, different types of stained glass you'll see in modern day because I, I just did modern aesthetics for this, for these illustrations. You'll see other lattes, which is like a diamond crosshatch. You'll see just like random spokes like just cutting the glass randomly surrounding the main focal image you'll sometimes see this border of like rectangle and then a square in every corner sometimes you'll see just like mosaic and then you may also see like a rectangular border like more modern this look was kind of developed more so in like the 50s 1950s so this is what I was, oh, and then also sometimes you'll see like this really fancy lattes where it has like dots and then the floral in every corner. So different types of stained glass will have either just like actual cut glass, textured glass, like where it has like a frosted layer on it to make it more opaque. So that was the sketches I did. And for this first line, since my usual style is very clean, not a lot of texture. These were the final illustrations. Scalpers do not screenshot. Either way, they're going on my website after today. So what I did is I transferred my sketches to a digital drawing program. I used the desktop version of Adobe Fresco. El Adobe, but the drawing program is pretty good. So these are all of the digital illustrations that I made just to get more clean on my work and to be able to actually transfer the images to the stamp block. Yeah, that's what we're working on. Now, there are different methods of transferring an image to your stamp block to carve. This is the method that I used growing up. You have to have an inkjet printer because the method is you cut out your image, print it from the, from the copy machine, and then you put it face down, douse it in nail polish remover, and then kind of press the ink into the surface of the rubber. This method will only work if you have, it's either inkjet or laser jet printer. It, it's the material of the ink. Because the way the copies work is the ink is like a powder. And in order for it to adhere to copy paper, it's like heat set. It's kind of similar to like how receipts are printed. Some are heat pressed, some are, um, we'll just show the text if it's like pressed, like if you read a pen on it or something. Kind of similar to that. The most popular method I will see for stamp carving, because not a lot of people have printers, because, you know, um, a printer can be quite expensive, is they will use um, a lead transfer. So it's where you get your paper, you cover one side entirely in pencil lead, and then you flip it over, and then you draw your image on top of the block, 
That way, when you lift up your paper, you will typically primarily see just the places where you drew on the block through the paper. But that method, you don't get as clear an image because it's not like actually heat set or anything. So yeah, I will definitely be doing more stamps in the future. Carving this one yesterday and like actually like doing it well, I felt so good. I felt proud. I looked at it, I was like, God damn. So let's hope I don't mess up the other three because this is the only stamp block I have. And look at this. It will only fit like three more because Speedball is like the main company for stamp blocks. You can buy more like expensive rubber material, but Speedball has like the softest, so you don't have to use a lot of strength or pressure. So it's good for me because I can be, I have weak hands, but I have strong fists. That is not a threat. The only bad thing about Speedball is if we look at this rubber block, if you look closely, you can kind of see the edges are rounded off. Because I assume the way they produce this is they just melt the rubber and then put it into like molds and shit. But because of that, the like usually an, half an inch to an inch from either side of the length of the block will not be completely flat like in the center. So because of that, it basically makes these edges unusable. It's fucking, it fucking sucks. And like, they've had this problem for years and years and years, but since Speedball has such a monopoly, they're not going to change or improve. Also, Speedball is the uh, lowest price point one too. So... Anyway, so like, for example, if I did my images like this, like if I carved my stamps like this on the edges, um, this side of the stamp would be off because then I would have to like rock the stamp when I print it. And that's not ideal. So if anybody asks, the reason why I'm going to be carving the stamps out of the center of the block is because Speedball sucks. Let's get them canceled, guys. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So, to counteract that, I was also thinking, I was going to run this by chat today. Since I can only use the fucking center of my speedball blocks and leave about an inch off of each side, what if every single... I talked about this briefly in the past. I don't know if I, like, talk, talked about it. But I was considering offering, like, an exclusive stamp print for every month. So, like, you know, since I got an extra inch off of every block I buy now. I can do like an exclusive inch size stamp print to include with every purchase for every month. So like if you buy something in August, you'll get a special stamp. Or print, not the actual stamp. <laughs> if you buy something during September, you'll have a different print during or compared to August. So it's kind of like incentivizing people to buy every month. Because if I'm going to be offering lower price price point items, I feel like it could be more affordable. And it's just like an extra thing for collectors. I kind of got inspired for that idea because a lot of places in Japan and a few art shops will offer like stamps when you visit a place. Like incentivizing those who have like collector's anxiety. <laughs> so I might consider doing that. Just making like a simple one inch stamp. Because if the stamp is small enough, it's fine if you have to rock it when you're printing. But if it's large like this, rocking it will we'll fuck up the whole image. But yeah, we'll think about it. I think it's a good idea. Okay, so that is an overview of what we're doing. Or the project so far. So enough you'd be up and it's been 25 minutes. Should get to carbon. Okay. This whole time I was not listening to music. Because, like, I can't talk and listen to shit. Which one should we do first? Well, I'm going to try and do all three today. Because each one takes about an hour, hour and a half. Do we want Daisy, Tulip, or Rose? Which one do you want first? First, first person to type gets to pick. I'm going to start cutting them out.
Tulip? Okay, that's the easiest one. W! <laughs> the tulip is easiest because it has the least amount of line work compared to the other two. Yeah, I cut out the rose because I, I thought you were going to guess rose. Not wrong. Okay, I'm asking for market research. Who would consider buying these prints? Now, keep in mind, you're not getting the stamp because the stamp is probably worth uh, $30 in terms of labor minimum. Probably $5 in material. You're not getting the stamp, but who would consider purchasing the actual cards? And no, I will not sell your data to Google. Don't worry. I would? Okay. Cool. So, when I got my printed image, I left about a millimeter or two border. Because what I'll see people do when they're carving stamps, is if you look at the first one I made, I left a little border along the edge. A lot of people will use a Zacto blade and cut off the entirety of the rubber on the edge. But I've noticed when you do that, you tend to rock your stamp more when you press. So... Whenever I'm putting like this millimeter border, whenever I cut out the print, I can literally place it up to exactly on the edges and not have to worry about like overlap. Oh, I'm so scared. The hardest part legit is transferring the image onto the block. So it's, it's sometimes it's a very unclean transfer, but the trick is you have to douse it, like completely drown it. In polish remover. I think it's because the alcohol content in here is what makes the ink kind of unset from the paper. I don't know why, but I, I think. Also getting a tissue to dab if I spill. Dab up. Okay, I'm ready. I'm using the lid to spread a little bit. You have to work fast when you're doing this part. And be careful to not shift the actual paper. Okay, so you're going to dab it to where it's mostly dry. And I use a, a paper creaser. But you can probably also use like a ruler if you don't have one. I think this is called a bone creaser. But this one is actually just from a ceramic carving tool set. I lost my mom's bow increaser. Uh, don't tell her. <laughs> or maybe she has it. Because <laughs> when we left her parents' house, I just took whatever craft shit I wanted. Because she's like, just take it all. I'm like, no, we literally cannot physically take it all. Because she has... Before we were born, my mom had like a whole bedroom dedicated to crafting. You know, she was one of those women. Who's like, not good at art. But like, this arts and crafts to feel like they're good at art. <gasps> So when we moved out, she's like, just take everything. I'm like, no, we literally can't take everything. <laughs> so I took, a, like, all the craft stuff that I owned. And, uh, like, maybe 10% of what she had. You know, she had some decent papers and stuff and glitters. But when we moved, the first time my friend came over and looked at my closet. Because I, I have two closets. Because I have the master bedroom. I gaslit everybody. Like... I have one closet for clothes and then another closet for just art supplies. Like, they looked at my closet and they were like, oh my god, peace, and you're crazy. I'm like, this is not even all of it. Okay, moment of truth. I really, I think I did this good. I don't know. This is the scariest part. Now, it's not going to peel off in one go. Oh, wait, this one actually came out pretty good. A lot better than my first transfer yesterday. Now, as you can see, the nail polish remover moved a lot of the ink from the paper and adhered it to the rubber. Like I said, I don't know why. I assume it's because of the alcohol content. You know, they, they want to get lit. So, I'm just going to very carefully rub my hands over the press to take off any remaining paper fibers. Just so I can see what exactly fully transferred. Now, when you're doing this part, like with the bone creaser, do not scrape too hard. 
do it like a, a medium strength level. Because if you do it too hard, you will tear the paper. Okay. That was actually a pretty clean transfer. Something you may notice as we're going through today. The rubber will have a flipped image of your of your printed image. That's because when you flip the stamp, you're literally flipping it. Damn. The rose looks funny. Wide. I think the leaves look cool. I mean, the rose isn't supposed to look realistic. I think the iris looks the most realistic. The other ones are supposed to like be more illustrative. Okay. Begin your new life. Because when you're working for like people who actually cut stained glass, there's not a lot of realism. The only stained glass that has the realism is stained glass that has like painted images on it, like not actual cut glass. That's why I think this was the best um illustrative line to open with because it's not intended to be hyper realistic. Also, I was talking to my sister because I showed her this stamp I made yesterday. And she's like, the only critique I have for you, Peason, is to vary the line widths. Um, because the line width is consistent throughout. When I did the illustration, I used a five point width. So this is like what five points look like when you print something out. Um, point is pixels. Um, or pico, sorry. She was saying I should have increased the line width of the iris to, like, make it stand out more. And I was like, yeah, but, like, if you think about it, this is supposed to emulate how stained glass would look. And the lines between stained glass is soldered, I think that's the word, soldered or melted metal. So it would not have different line widths in between different cuts of glass. And even if it's the same width, it'll have some disparities where, like, some parts of the metal melted would be thinner or thicker. So, all the design choices were very intentional. I legit can't work, or I can't wait till I can afford to buy more, like, paper and stuff. Because I really want to start working on, like, a paper cut series. Because, um, I think I figured out an idea of how to work with vellum paper. I would just, because, like, the idea for paper cuts that are steam, stained glass-like is to use vellum paper, which is, um, it's a clear paper, but it's kind of frosty. It looks like a frosted window. I could probably remove some of the wash with some type of like alcohol product and then use a color wash of slightly diluted paint. So I cannot wait till I could buy a big stack of vellum paper to just play around. String to stop. Quit playing peekaboo. Oh, wait! This is the stamp we made on stream that one time. I had it in my little case. Remember this? So, like, every single month, I would just make a little mosaic tile like this. Because then I think it would be kind of like a quilt. Like, if people want to collect the little tiles every month, they can make a little, like, quilt paper illustration on their own. Okay, so since most of this design transferred, I don't gotta draw too much in, thankfully. I'm going to be using Sharpie. This is literally my favorite Sharpie. It got discontinued. So any Oilers, if you want to buy me a Sharpie Extra Fine Point, it has a kind of felty tip instead of the plastic tip. It's so nice. They have cases on eBay for like 50 bucks. If I ever open a P.O. box, please buy me some. Please, please, please. Because since they were discontinued... Obviously, the only people who have it are those who hoarded it back in the day. What is really nice about the transfer method using the nail polish remover is that no matter how detailed your print is, for the most part, it'll basically fully transfer. I wrote you to the block, that way my hand doesn't drag across.
Also, chat. I did mention on the main channel my grandma's sick. She does have leukemia. L for leukemia. So we're going to visit her in September. That's why I'm trying to get art out like now. And also, I'm doing the Sabbath on August 2nd. I'm not delaying it till September. I still would do a cycle Sabbath on in September, though. But the problem is... <laughs> um, they we're planning the trip for, like, late September. So, the only time I can do the cycle Sabbath on when subscriptions are discounted is the end of the month. So I would only have like a one day break from traveling <laughs> and then we do the Psycho Sabathon. I'm gonna die. But um because we were looking at ticket prices yesterday and it's gonna cost about five hundred dollars for a round trip. Because we still don't know like we know what day we're gonna go, but we don't know what day we're gonna go home yet. So either way, it's gonna cost five hundred dollars per person. So, guys, sub with Prime on the main channel, please. Yeah, it's honestly not too bad. But still, my my monthly income is like $150. And my expenses are $200. <laughs> so every month I'm just in the hole. <laughs> Your credit card got points? Oh, I think Kim mentioned that in chat the other day, too. But my sister and I were, like, looking at credit cards, right? Like, just looking. And she filled out an application, like, just to see what she get a she could get approved for. Because, you know, she's, like, 23. She has a really good credit history. Her credit score is, like, really fucking high. You know how much her credit limit was that she got pre-approved for? Keep in mind, her annual income is below poverty still, because she's not working full-time yet. Her credit limit she got pre-approved for? $24,000. Twenty-three. $24,000 limit she got pre-approved for. We were both looking at it, like, in shock. Because, like, a normal credit maximum limit is, like, maybe 2000 maybe 5000 for, like, a young person. But she got pre-approved for $24,000 limit. Which is really fucked up, if you think about. Because if you're young and you don't know how credit works, like, if you see you can spend $24,000, you're gonna want to spend $24,000. Thankfully, she's not an idiot. But we were just like, oh my god, that's... She did not get the card. Because, <laughs> obviously, she might be tempted. <laughs> but, holy shit! Also, thank you for the follow, too. Thank you. What are we in? You know what, Tooth? I'll let you chat right away. Just behave, please. <laughs> we got you chatted instantly. <laughs> Hi, Tooth. Welcome in. Okay, sh enough yapping. I had it locked in. What if I just re enabled 10 minute chat? Would you be really mad? <laughs> okay, so a mistake I made when carving this first stamp. And usually when you work with stamp, you want to work from the inside out. That way, if you mess up a line, you can kind of like fix it. But an issue I had was I did the inner border first and then carved along the outer edge. And that's why some of the edge lines are uneven here. So I think for this stamp, I'm going to carve out the outer border first because I'm confident in my ability. And the only way I'm going to fuck up is if there's an earthquake or some shit. So, I never do this when I carve stamps. If you're going to carve stamps as a beginner, do not carve out your outer edge first. Do not. Because <laughs> you will mess up. But I'm a pro, and look at this. I did this in an hour and a half yesterday, and it's pretty fucking clean. So, the only reason I'm, kind of, I'm cutting out the outer border, border... The only reason why I'm cutting out the outer border first is so I can get cleaner lines on my interior border. Stamps are kind of magical to me, at least when people make them from scratch. Oh, thank you. Prepare to be amazed. I've been carving stamps for years. I used to do it all the time when I was a teenager, but my skills have drastically improved compared to like five years ago, so. Okay. Now I'm gonna lock in. I'm still gonna like read and look and chat. I just might not answer uh, comments right away. So. I'm here and I'm queer. Love the stained glass pattern. Thank you. I did it myself. Okay. 
I'm so nervous. I'm also at a different table. I brought my I brought that desk back in my room. You know, I set up a little art station in the hallway for my sister and she didn't use it. L sister. We're uncontainable. Next, you'll tell me you also made the phone? Nah. I would never work with, like, resident shit. I don't want to get cancer. My grandma already has cancer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm locking in. I'm locking in. Wait, can you see my head? Oh, there's a shadow. Okay, when I work, I'm like this close to my, the rubber. So, <laughs> if okay, I'm locking in. Um, editor, put this at 10 times speed, please. This is like those videos you see of people people decorating cupcakes and cakes, and it takes two seconds, but in reality, it takes like an hour. Okay, that was a decently clean line. Um, is that a special type of rubber? This is Speedball branded blocks, so it is like a rubbery material. Picture eraser. But a really, really hard eraser. You can also make stamps out of erasers, too. That's what I used to do. I used to take my erasers from school, carve a little stuff out, and stamp it on people's papers. I was a nuisance. So that was one single stroke. Now, contrary to drawing, carving, you're using, or I primarily use my wrist or my fingers to move. Um, run back the footage, but when I was doing this this line, I was moving the block and then also moving my fingers. Versus in contrary, when you're drawing, you're usually going to use your elbow joint or your arm joint to move your tool. So carving uses a whole different muscle set. It also really fucking hurts your hands if you do it for too long. But you just have to make sure you find a carving tool that is good for your hand. Um, I personally find tools that are wider, that way you don't have to, like, um, because when you grip a pencil, you have to, like, kind of curl your fingers like this, but if you get a paintbrush or a carving tool that has a wider handle, you don't have to, like, pinch your fingers as much. You don't use your fingers when drawing? No wonder I suck. I mean, you do use your fingers, but it's more about, like, the movement in which you are manipulating your tool. That's why I don't like digital art too much because it's like hitting the image on a screen when like traditional art, it's a lot about like your mobility and technique, right? Or that's also why like I fucking suck at digital art. Like I'm not good at it. Because like the way you hold a paintbrush can drastically change the shape and texture of the stroke on the canvas. But on digital art, it's just the pressure in which you push your finger. It's it's totally obscure to me. Okay, anyway, back to work. This life ain't fair for a soul. Okay. Now, stamp carving is really stressful because it... Okay, I'm gonna not going to use the tool to demonstrate. But, like, if I go like this, it's, like, over. The stamp is ruined. So, it takes a lot of concentration. It's, I think, one of the harder art mediums to be good at. My particular style when carving stamps is I like just clean line art. It stamps the best. It's best for when you're doing, like, embossing prints. Embossing, which we might have time to do, I don't know. Embossing is when you use a special, like, adhesive ink. You put plastic powder on it, you melt the powder, and then you get, like, a raised image. Traditional embossing is where, like, just, like, the 
the paper is like pressed to be raised. Uh, guy, click the follow button right now, and I'll say thank you. I saw a guy who paid you using Microsoft Excel. I guess that would be like Pixlr, right? Have I ever tried doing portrait champs? Um, yeah, back when I was little, but I don't know if I would. I've seen people like do custom portrait stamps for like weddings or like couples and shit. And yeah, that's cool, but when are you going to use that stamp as a consumer? Because, like, yeah, the novelty of getting a custom stamp, oh my god, it's so cool. But, like, when in reality are you going to be stamping your faces on a paper? It's more like memorabilia. Exactly. Exactly. It, to me, it's, memorabilia is novelty, and that's not like a... Like, if you're going to buy something... Oh, I, I think the reason why I don't like it is because, like, I'm a very practical person. Like, I will only buy something if I genuinely need it, or I will be able to use it many times. There are very little things that I buy for appreciation or decoration. That's why, like, for wedding memorabilia, I like the people who do the live portraits, because that's something that you can, like, display in your home. But, like, the stamps? Eh. Why buy decor when you can make it yourself? That's what my sister is saying. She's saying whenever we have like money, we'll just like go to Goodwill, buy some like large canvases, remove the paint, and just hang up stuff in our house when we buy a house when I become a famous YouTuber. I think I fucked up this line. So when you're, okay, I'm kind of off screen. When you are doing a line that is very close to a corner, you kind of have to push more and stab. That way you get a clean corner. Because if you put the same pressure as you did here, you'll get like a, a curved edge. Okay, the line, the line, the borders are pretty clean. The one on the bottom, this side is a little bit thicker, but it's not super noticeable. Now, I, as you see me work, similar to when I draw, I will keep rotating the rubber because you don't want to like twist your wrist in an unnatural direction. Because like if you're carving this way, obviously you're carving towards yourself. Don't do that. Just like knives, don't pull towards yourself. Because like these, I should not do my finger. <laughs> um, these are like sharp but they're not like knives like if, if you like accidentally like clip like if you go like this when you're carving and you hit your finger you're not gonna like bleed out but it's still not fun <laughs> so when you're carving please make sure you're not pointing towards yourself or be careful be, care be very careful like when you're holding the tool and it's pointing towards your hand like if you're grabbing a rubber like just be careful yeah, don't stab yourself. Twitch Dev, I'm being very clear to be safe. <laughs> okay, so the borders are done. Now, when I carve stamps, as you can see, I'm leaving the image on the main block. A lot of people, when they're carving, um, they'll use a Zacto blade, and then they'll cut this piece off, and then only, like work with rubber this big but the problem is like if you fuck up you can still like carve on the back but then you'd have to make sure your next image is exactly this size so that's why i'm not cutting this image off the entire block because like if i do fuck up i'll just use the back <clears throat> because this rubber is about oh wait i have a ruler This rubber is about half a centimeter. So when you're carving, you're only carving like a quarter of a centimeter. So if you mess up, you can always flip over your block. Are double-sided stamps a good idea? There's pros and cons. The pros can be like you're using less material. The cons can be what? Because when you press, you're using your hand or you can use like a rubber block tool. Um... 
you would get ink on your hand and the more because the rubber is very fragile like if i go like this it's not gonna tear but the more you stamp an image the more likely it'll break um so if it's double-sided you're just gonna be like rubbing against it more so a double-sided stamp is good if you're trying to save material but not good if you're looking for the longevity of your actual stamp the rubber doesn't like wear down too much but it's more like if you like like if you stamp and you jostle it too much if you have like very fine details like let's say you did like a pointillism style where you have like very small dots like the more you wiggle it the more you press it, it could accidentally break it just depends on like if you have like super fine details in it okay enough yapping there's a reason why i don't have the speed run time around tonight on today's because we're explain this is the first time we're ever doing stamps Now, when I did the iris run, I did the flower first. Should I do the border first? I kind of want to do the border first, just to explain technique a little bit. So, straight lines are very difficult. Corners are the most difficult when carving stamps because... I can show here. Obviously, straight edges are difficult because you have to hold your tool in a completely straight stroke. Now, you can see... When I'm doing the straight line, I'm extending my fingers because I went like fingers crunched. And as I'm moving, I'm extending them forward and pushing my tool with my fingers versus a curved line where I can just move my wrist. Curved lines are a lot more easier because when you're moving your wrist, you're moving your wrist ball joint and then your elbow, which is also a ball joint. But when you're doing a straight line, you're moving your fingers, which is a hinge joint. Hinge joints are ones that only move like up and down or left or right. So you have a lot less mobility versus a ball joint where you can basically move almost 360. That is why carving stamps, straight edges are a lot more harder. Same thing with corners because you don't want a rounded corner typically. So in this, in this final stamp, the corners are pretty straight edge they're not perfect 90 degrees but not the corners are not curved are that curves would be harder no no they appear harder because if you're doing like a long curved line you would have to do it in one stroke yes because to demonstrate a lot of little art lesson this is how you identify who is drawn and who is not drawn so Somebody who draws will draw a circle in one stroke. What you may see in people who don't know how to draw a circle is they'll do this. They'll do multiple smaller strokes. Okay, granted, that circle is cleaner. But when you do multiple smaller strokes, you kind of fatigue your fingers a bit more. And also, you're not looking at like the whole shape when you're doing like etch a sketch lines like that like if you have somebody to draw a stroke versus somebody who's new they'd probably do like multiple strokes like that so yeah doing a curvature in one stroke is easier versus doing like multiple strokes or lines anyway back to the carving i think i want to do the border first just to explain how i do corners um should i zoom in I don't believe you. I'm only making my camera bigger. I don't want to zoom in the camera. It's already pretty zoomed. Okay. So how we do corners. Corners are really difficult. The reason is... When you carve, when you stop your tool, you have to pull out the rubber. So you will get like this straight corner edge. And if you do like a soft, oh sorry, if you do like a soft carving, you can kind of lift your tool up, but then it pushes the line forward a bit. Follow my channel, guys. Click right now and I'll tell you thank you.
Man, imagine all the progress you'd make without me here. No, it's fine. The whole point of doing it live is to, like, explain a little bit. Because I think art is good, and art should be fully funded by the government. So I think the more people learn, the better. I'm just glad. Usually for art streams, we don't have a lot of chatter, so, like, I can lock in, but... I'm just glad folks are, like, watching, lurking, hanging out. Because, like, yeah, if I did this... If I did this offline, I would get this done in an hour, but... Oh, well. So, to re-explain, when you do corners, I'm going to demonstrate on the small piece here. You do the one edge. You pull out a little bit before the edge of the corner. And then from the perpendicular side, you're going to come in and kind of dig out the corner a little further than when the first stroke was, and then you kind of force it out. It, it's, it's hard if, like... You're not there in person. But it's little techniques that you can do to get cleaner line work. Free healthcare and art supplies. Yes, sir. So I'm going to make a corner here just to demonstrate a little bit. So this is the corner I'm trying to carve out. So obviously carving the outside edge, really easy. Because this is what we did for that first four edges. Push through. Interior corners are a lot harder. So you could start, depending on if you're doing a rectangle or a square, you can either start your corner from the inner edge or you can start from the outer edge. For this demo, I'll start from the inner edge. So... You're going to position your tool like the very inner corner at the corner of your rubber. Lean. So that's the corner method when you're starting from the inner corner. But you can't always do that, because for this design, you can't always start from the inner corner on every stroke, because it's four-sided. So I'm just going to draw the opposite edge of the square. So, if you can't start from the inner corner, if you're going from the opposite edge, as you approach the corner, you pull out your tool right before you actually touch the corner line. Come in from the opposite edge. Oh, it's not on camera. Come in from the opposite edge. Instead of lifting your tool straight up, you're going to turn it to get that clean corner. And it won't be a perfect right angle, but it's going to be as close as you can get to one. There we go. So that's how you do corners, interior corners. I think interior corners is the hardest thing to carve. And this design has like 20 plus interior corners. <laughs> okay, I'm going to lock in now. I think that's all the lessons that I verbally have to give. The rest is just carving. I'm locked in. We're an hour in, and I've done four strokes. When I say stroke, I mean, like, lines. Okay, I'm locked in. Is the carving just shearing, or does it also have technique? What is shearing? I've never heard of that. There are different ways to carve. I use the most common, which is just using um, a divoted tip to make grooves in it. Oh, like shearing sheep? Oh, okay. 
Um, there is. I I can kind of get where you get what you're putting down. So another method. These are all my tools. They're all rusty because they're like 20 years old. Hopefully I don't get tetanus. Wait. Oh yeah, I don't have any open cuts. <laughs> Awkward. Another method of carving stamps. I think this is the last little mini lesson. This blade is a just a Zacto blade. Another method instead of carving divots in the rubber is I don't know how to do this method but you make slices into the rubber you make a slice at a 90 degree straight up and then you make another slice at a diagonal and then you just do that over and over with all your lines it's a quicker technique but it's very easy to fuck up because if you do like a long stroke like this and then you go at a diagonal and then you're just supposed to like, I, I've practiced it, but like I've cut myself doing this method. So like, I don't like it. Yeah, it's, it, it's very scary. <laughs> you're supposed to make a, a line and then you're supposed to go at a diagonal like this. But the, the problem is, it's very easy to, um, like, cut under your initial line. The margin of error is very hard, is very big when you do the Zacto knife method. Or maybe it's just me. I'm not good at it. No open cuts. You have no pets. Yeah. I want a cat so bad. Like, legitimately, a cat would, like, cure my mental health. But we're not allowed to have cats in our unit. So, because we're renting out rooms in a family friend's house and like, yeah, you could get like an accommodation, like do the legal route to get a cat, but it's kind of like not worth. But when I, when I get my YouTuber mansion, I'm going to get so many cats. When I carve, I use just one tool. I don't like switching the nibs a lot. Also, the nib I have does not come with the speedball set. This is a custom nib my mom bought 20 years ago from like an Etsy seller. So I have no clue where I got this. This nib is really nice because since it's angled this way, the edge instead of this way, you can get a lot cleaner line work. Okay, one corner done. I'm locking in. Instead of doing one corner at a time, I'm going to do all my vertical strokes. I have to be very careful because I can't allow these strokes to cross the outer edge that I already carved.
Uh, guys, click the follow button right now, and I'll say thank you. <laughs> if we get a million followers today, I'll show my face. I'm not even kidding. I think I'll zoom in a little bit. No, I'll leave it. I'm locked in. It took like four minutes. There's like a weird pressure to not mess up. It's because I know this material is expensive. I think the whole block, which is... Six... Six by twelve block is like fifteen bucks. Fifteen to twenty bucks. Yeah, face reveal at a million subs, guys. Can we do it? If you see peace in underscore 17, don't be fooled. It's not her. Yeah. See, you got it. This is not me. Okay. The lines are pretty clean. A way that I messed up all the time when I was younger is carving out these larger sections. Because, yeah, I'm locked in whenever I'm doing, like, the line art. But when I would try to carve out these large chunks, you have to use a bit more pressure. But it's very easy to, when you put more pressure, for your tool to slip and you make a carve you didn't mean to make. Now, you might see, when I'm doing these larger carves to just take little chunks out, instead of lifting my tool up, I will put my finger down to tear it. That way I have a bit more control versus just doing this. I can just pull it out easier if I press my finger against the base of the tool. Like I said, these tools are not sharp. Don't carve towards myself. I may notice when I'm carving out the larger sections, I will do a diagonal around the corner edge, turn in my tool. It's a lot quicker than doing straight diagonal strokes or straight, straight horizontal or vertical strokes. Because I'm speed running. Because I need to get... I don't need to get all three done today, but I kind of want to, you know? And type one if you'll buy the prints. Be honest. I want to get a million sales by Friday.
Well, that's one border done. On to the next. So it's just going to be the same thing. If I had the money, it'd be a one. Don't worry about it. Whenever, or when these launch on Friday, I will be doing a giveaway on my main channel on Friday. So make sure you watch that stream on Friday. I don't know what time yet. Because <laughs> st I'm still planning on, like, how I want to do the stream. But whenever we have, like, a, a drop, I usually do a giveaway. But since I'm doing smaller pieces, we might do a, like, every other mother giveaway stream. Because last year... I gave away, like, a full painting two times, and then I gave out gift cards. But the price point for these lino prints will probably be, like, 7 to 20 USD. 20 would be, like, if I did, like, full watercolor, watercolor. At least with stamps, you don't need to purchase money materials. Yeah. It's not like I'd have to buy, like, a lot of paint. They'd also be the easiest to ship, because I can just put them in a standard letter envelope. And even shipping internationally would just be, like, max, like, three forever stamps or something, I think. So, like, three bucks or some shit. So, like, any of these lino print prints will have free shipping. Easy. Because to ship the normal paintings, it like, for even for like NA people, it costs like 15, 20 bucks. I'm going to try and like move it back a little bit. That line is crooked. Have I had trouble shipping art? Uh, no. I haven't shipped internationally yet. My only concern about shipping internationally is that for some countries, you have to have, like, a custom sheet that, like, explains what's in your package, right? So, like, I would be scared of, like, my, my painting being, like, flagged or some shit and then they ruin it in customs, but... I've only had two NA people order, so it's been fine. <laughs> but always no real issue. I think the first painting I shipped, the box got dented, but when I shipped the paintings, I put extra cardboard. That way, like, heaven forbid somebody steps on it, it won't break it. <laughs> Definitely not drugs, trust, yeah. <laughs> You know what? I'll say it. I don't think drugs should be illegal. Because I'm a believer that for most anything, if there's regulation, then it'll lead to more safety. More safety and then also, like, education.
Depends on the substance. Oh, definitely, but... I, I didn't... Did I say legalize all drugs, or did I say most? <laughs> uh, legalize most drugs. Also, Twitch staff, I've never done a drug in my life. I'm not even kidding. My doctors always get surprised when I say that. I haven't even smoked a cigarette. I'm too scared of getting lung cancer. Also, chat, I haven't weighed myself in like a month and a half, and I'm down two pounds. Biking every day is helping. Because the only like kind of shitty thing about the Hawaii trip is that it's not for fun. Like, my grandma expects us to do like yard work every day because, you know, she needs help, which is like totally valid. So like, I'm going to need to like shape up a little bit by September. You know, I don't want to die in the fields. <laughs> a friend of mine thinks that everything should be legal but i think that even if there's regulation there it could still harm people i i understand that sentiment but with legalization there would be less criminalization so less people in the prison system there would be probably more funding for like education resources for like young people so they know like how to safely do things and then also like how to look out for like tainted drugs and shit they probably be more education like of like testing kits for drugs probably more accessible um boots for drug testing or like um drug overdose boots i know in my city a lot of government spaces or public buildings will have like a vending machine that has like free like overdose kits or overdose yeah overdose kits so yeah people will still get hurt but i think Right, probably people would know how to like s help and save individuals who could potentially be hurt. Does your grandma have a big field? No, I was kidding. But she does have a sizable garden. Um, I think she has like a, an acre and a half. Like her house is pretty small, but she has a whole bunch of fruit trees. She has a whole bunch of foliage. For the most part, they have like a sprinkler sprinkler system, but she still needs help like doing the dailies. She usually has, like, the neighbors help her out because, you know, she's old. But I, I haven't been to Hawaii in six years. Yeah, as with anything, there's always a risk of harm. I agree with that sentiment. One of my friends, um, they hate my opinion when it comes to drugs. <laughs> um... Because they had someone in their family who was addicted to, like, hardcore drugs. So they think that everything should be illegal. But it's like... <sighs> you want people to do things safely. You want people to have access to resources. And the way that gets better is through legalization of some means. Because I do feel like um, making it more legal for certain substances would take away some stigma from people but as with anything there's no perfect solution your crime should be illegal for real for real <laughs> on god on god I have a protein shake today. I took the label off because I don't want to be seen as like a sponsor of me. What part of Asia am I from? Um, I'm Asian Hispanic. Asian side is Japanese. I'm technically fourth gen. 
and then I'm Cuban and Puerto Rican. I don't know how to speak Japanese though, but I am learning on Duolingo. Sponsored streams when? I'm already sponsored by Peace and Art. Guys, click the link in chat. Bookmark the website right now. I would only take sponsored streams if I get a guaranteed payout. A lot of sponsors will scam smaller creators and just offer them like a royalty link. So, for example, if you stream Raid Shadow Legends, we'll give you a $5 for every sign-up, but then you only get two sign-ups and you've been shilling sh 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 uh, Raid Shadow Legends for five hours. Like, you should be paid for your time, the cost it takes to produce, like, a photo shoot or a video to post, along with royalties. So I'm not going to take any sponsors until I have a large enough follower base or viewer count to have more power at the bargaining table. Plus, like, when I started watching YouTube in, like, 2013, 2014, that's when, like, people hated sponsored videos. People hated YouTubers getting a bag. But now people, like, don't care. So I still have that little sentiment where I'm like, a sponsored stream? How cringe. I'm not gonna watch. <laughs> the raid deal sounds like prostitution. Whoa! Whoa, dude! Mods, get him! <laughs> I deal with you. Dude, I cannot wait to like get these corners done. They're so annoying. I think it's because I value my time a lot because I have very limited time. Because since I'm disabled, like, I literally have, like, a limited time frame of the day which I can do work. So it's like, I'm not going to waste time shilling a sponsor if I'm not going to get a guaranteed bag. <laughs> Can't get me? There's a zero in the word? Mods? Permanently banned tooth from this chat and the piece in chat for one second. <laughs> How about getting paid by a sponsor like HelloFresh, but get paid with the product? Okay, we talked about this before, I think last week on stream. But the problem with taking product for payment. Tax-wise, in the States, there's a huge differentiating factor. So, like, let's say you do get a sponsor for, like, a purse company. And they give you a purse. And they say, hey, if we give you this purse, can you film an Instagram reel? And you're like, okay. So you film an Instagram reel, you post it, you're like, hey, I got this purse. It may seem, like, on paper, or sorry, it may seem anecdotally that, oh, they gave you a purse and you made a video, but on paper, tax and business wise, that counts as a trade of goods or payment. Because if they explicitly gave you a deal that said, we give you a purse for free, you make this video, that purse that you got for free counts as payment. So if they give you a $2,000 purse market value, that means they technically paid you $2,000. Also guys, click follow right now and I'll say thank you. So that is one avenue where if they give you a product for free, but they say you must make a post, that counts as a payment. Versus if they give you the purse for free, and they say, here's a gift. That's a gift. You are not contractually obligated to like make a video or post about that gift, but you can choose to. Tax-wise, that does not count as income for you, the creator, 
but it counts for the business as a tax write-off for gifts, which is is good because yeah, you got the purse for free, but the the business could get a potential tax write-off. So that's why it's very important if you're a creator or if you know anybody who wants to make videos and shit and takes a sponsor, if they give you shit for free, make sure there's no contractual obligation to make a post or anything, because. Um, the, the reason I learned about this is was this one influencer I saw randomly on TikTok, like just come up in my feed, and she was saying how one year her tax person was like, oh, you owe like 20000 in taxes this year because you received this much in gifts and it technically counted as income because she, she got a bunch of like free makeup and shit. So she got cooked that year. So yeah, don't take product for free unless it's like legit a gift. That's why you'll see content creators who receive things will be like, oh, this was a gift in the description or something. That way, if their tax person is like, hey, what is this? They can say like, oh, I said it was a gift. Just as like another layer of proof. Or if you have like an email chain of it. Uh, I don't know why I'm working on this mat. I don't need the mat yet. I'm not using this Acto blade. But yeah, so TLDR, if a sponsor is giving you product for free, make sure it's free. If there's any obligation for you to make a post, it is not free. The company is trying to scam you. Because if that company claims that free product as a, as a payment, then you are obligated to report it on your taxes as income. And I think that would classify as like a, a ten forty miscellaneous income. Tell them to send the money to you to buy the product. That's what some companies do. And I think that's better. Because then it would count as like a payout. No, wait, that's worse. I don't know. I actually don't know how that would be classified as. All right. I I don't know if they, I don't know if they would just send you money. I think they would just like send you like they would probably make you order the product. That way you the 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 creator could be like, "Oh, I purchased this, so therefore it's a business expense." I don't know if they would like send you money to buy their shit. That that doesn't seem right. Because the business sending you the creator money, that would count as income. I don't know. You know, I don't have to worry about this shit because I don't ever want to take a sponsor. We're only going to be sponsored by Peace and Art. Yeah, I, I think like an invoice would make the most sense. But you know what's cool? Since I own the Peace and Art like business license, it technically does not count as me like shilling a sponsored product. Because like, you know how you see on like Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, there's like, a little pop up that says, this is a sponsored message. Or like, this is a sponsored video. Since I own the company, I'm not paid to talk about my company. A company that has made three sales, W. Because I remember, I think it was last year, where Twitch was trying to like basically heavily repress any third-party sponsored stream content like they were trying to restrict people's like on-stream overlays for sponsored companies they were trying to restrict like you literally doing a sponsored stream that was not with a twitch affiliated sponsor but they kind of reneged on it because everybody was getting mad mm-hmm <laughs>
Almost done with the border. Three quarters done now. Legit, the border is the hardest part. I think it's smarter to do the border first. That way I can, like, not stress about it for the other two. Clean. I haven't messed up yet. I'm so proud of that. Realistically, I can maybe get one more stamp done today. I don't know. We'll see. My hands don't hurt. I feel good. Gonna have more of my protein shake. Maybe, <laughs> sorry, I can't talk. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't hurt because the yapping in between. Honestly, probably you're right. I mean, when I'm doing anything now, I have to like take a break like every 15 minutes usually. Like if I'm editing or like reading or researching. I think my attention is fucked. I don't know if it's because of my like my condition or like the internet has broken me like for real this time. Because I have a brain condition that affects my cognitive ability at times, like my ability to speak or think. So like, I don't know if my attention span is like affected by that or like if, you know, the internet's too fun. I don't know yet. Like everybody's yapping about giving Biden those cognitive tests. Like, bitch, I've literally taken those. And I'm smart as shit still, even though I can't speak sometimes. Having a subway surfer stream on the side, I have never, like, needed a visual stimulus like that. Those distract me even more. I don't know how the Zoomers do it. I used to, like, need to have two streams of audio playing, so, like, like, if I was editing a video, I would have to have, like, a different sound like music or like another like live stream on or something as I'm editing to like make me focus but now I can't do that anymore I have to have complete like utter silence when I'm editing you're my subway servers oh you're too cute what are you supposed to be doing now huh are you at work what are you doing at tooth's boss in chat I usually always have, like, a Twitch stream on my TV running. Besides that I am streaming, you know, I want to, like, give you guys my full attention. I was doing some work stuff, but I'm free now? Okay, good. You gotta have... What's the hotkey to, like, close the tab? I forgot. I never do that because I never have to hide anything. I used to always have TV on in the background. That's me right now. It's like... Not to be parasocial, but, like... <laughs> like, having a Twitch stream on in particular, it feels like you have, like, a friend on in the room. And it's weird because like I'm a girly, right? Um uh, guys, guys, click follow right now and you're my friend. I'm not even kidding. It's weird. I'm a girly, right? But I personally I like the sound of like a male voice more. I watch a lot of male Twitch streamers and like I feel bad because you know I'm not like helping the girlies out, but 
I just like the sound of men's voices. Maybe I have issues. <laughs> I don't have a TV right now, that's why I got into Twitch more. No, for real. I legit never used to use my TV before I like started watching Twitch. I would just watch stuff on my phone. Because to fall asleep, I usually put on like a YouTube video or a stream. As of recent, I've been watching like Streech Squeaks' VODs on his VOD channel. Like literally just to fall asleep. I used to like watch YouTube on my phone, but that became a problem because, you know, you gotta hold your phone up when you're sleeping. And then like since it was so close to my face, I think the blue light was just like infiltrating my brain. <laughs> I'm looking at it like close up to my eyes. Don't worry, one day we'll get a two cam set up for the art stream, I promise. When I get my YouTube money, we'll have like a full studio POV. To sleep, I usually just prefer the AC. Oh, I cannot stand fan sounds. I can't. I cannot. What's really weird though is like if I fall asleep to a YouTube video, I have turned off autoplay for this reason. Cause there was one night where I was watching like like a Ludwig video, so like a happier stream. And then I woke up and it showed that my video history like pulled up true crime videos and literally that night I had a dream about like being like chased and murked. So I'm like convinced. That, like, if I listen to, like, happy audio when I fall asleep, I have good dreams. I don't know, it's weird. You end up watching iceberg vids? Yeah, I know. Like, my YouTube recommended is pretty good. But I get some wild shit sometimes. Because, like, my sister, for some reason... Um, she refuses to, like, log into her YouTube account on, on, like, the living room TV. So she will always use my account. And, like, she watches history videos. She watches, like, um, video essays. Like, like, nerd shit. So my recommended is, like, nerd shit now. <laughs> like, I go to YouTube to have fun, not to, like, go back to school. It's really funny, because, like, she'll watch, like... A lot of, like, uh, foreign history videos, like, <laughs> Twitch staff? <laughs> this is not me. Um, my sister will watch, like, North Korea, like, history videos. <laughs> like, <laughs> there, were, there was a week where, like, I would go in her room or go to the living room and she'd be, like, watching, like, another North Korea mini dog. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? My recommended page is so whack because I use it to research for work. Now, you don't have to leak what you do for work, but what does your recommended entail? You know, we have a lot of intellectuals in my Twitch chat room. We have somebody who went to college when they were 14. They're like my age now. And then we have another individual. We have two chatters who are in law school. <laughs> Be on the look at when she tries to purchase plane tickets. No, my sister has asked me, like, whenever, um, <laughs> whenever, <laughs> when she was, like, into watching those mini dogs, she would ask me. She's like, would you go to North Korea? She's like, if you ever get famous and, like, they ask you to go for tourism, would you go? I'm like, no. I'm like, no. I would be canceled. <laughs> it's easier to say that I'm a writer. Are you a fanfic writer? Be honest. If so, that's... Oh my god, I thought I fucked up. Okay, I'm fine. My, my tool, I don't know if you saw it, it clipped up like this. I almost clipped the borderline. Oh my god, I almost went over the border. I told you, the most- the parts that I mess up is carving out the large chunks. I need to lock in, no more yapping. She wants to try their perfect burgers? Nah, she doesn't like burgers that much. She only likes Wendy's.
Just article and script writer? Wait, that's kind of cool. That means you're, like, smart. You know what? I technically have a bachelor's of science hyphen graphic design. Mostly YouTube script writer? Oh, so do you make videos? Or do you write for other people? For my thesis, I'm studying systems engineering. Wait, I have so many smart viewers. <laughs> I wrote for other people. Okay, cool. I swear, like, the smartest people will watch the dumbest streamers. <laughs> Which, I'm not saying I'm dumb, it's just some of my streams are kind of silly. Since I'm not working right now, anytime, like, somebody asks what I do for work, like, if I'm in, like, an Uber or something, I lie, and I say that I'm a, I'm a video editor, and that I make TikToks for people, which is kind of true, because, like, I edit my own videos, and, like, I do edit TikToks, it's just the person is for me. You know, I can't hop into an Uber and be like, oh yeah, I'm a streamer. And they have, you have to explain what streaming is to them. They're like, you play video games for a living, huh? But yeah, I lie. Clean, look at that. I didn't mess up at all, W. Okay, now the hard part is done. The interior design still has straight edges, but it's a lot easier than corners. Like, diagonal corners like this are a lot easier than a straight edge corner. So excited that's over. My god. Because if it's a, a diagonal corner, instead of pulling your tool out, you could just turn. Clean. You know, see if you look at the rubber shaving that came out. Perfect diagonal. Will the interior part be easy? Oh, a lot easier. Because the curved lines you can do in one single stroke. And the diagonal corners you can also do in one stroke versus lifting up your tool to get a, a cleaner 90 degree. It'll be a lot easier. I think definitely doing the corners first or the outer border first is the way to go for this for this design. Lean just to demonstrate, with the diagonal corners, like an obtuse angle, you could do it in one stroke instead of lifting up and going in from two sides. Clean. Uh, guys, click follow right now and I'll tell you thank you. I'm not even kidding. We've already gotten one follower today. Can we get four more and hit our daily goal?
I could never film a speed painting video or speed carving video because I rotate my working plane too much. Like, y'all have seen the speed painting videos where the canvas just stays in the same spot the whole time and they're moving like this around with their paintbrush. It's not good for your wrists. Like, yeah, it's a good aesthetic for the video, but it's a lot harder to work in. Do you have wristbands or something like that for support? Oh, like the the wrist sleeves? Um, no. I I find they don't help me. I think it's because like not to be sad, <laughs> but I have chronic pain like all over my body, so like having pain in my hands and wrists is just like normal. <laughs> so Whenever it gets to a point where, like, I should stop and it really hurts, I stop. I'm really good about doing that. Like, taking breaks when I need to. <clears throat> but, like, I don't like having shit on my... Like, okay. <laughs> I always say this without being weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't like the sensation of things on my skin. So, like, sometimes I don't even like my shorts on my shirt. It It really bothers me. So, like, I did try, like, the little wrist sleeves they have for artists and stuff. But, like, anytime an award, I could just not, I could not think about, or I could not stop thinking about, like, me wearing it. Like, I could just, I could only think about the sensation of, like, it on my skin. I didn't like it. My mom also has chronic pain. I think that has made her even more resilient. Meanwhile, I get taken out by a headache. That's a good way to see it. But... I didn't truly understand the sentiment until I started experiencing chronic pain. Like, even if somebody seems fine, it doesn't mean that they are. Like, it's very easy to mask pain when you're in pain all the time. So, obviously it's your mom. But, depending on what she's comfortable with, like, don't... Don't be afraid to, like, offer her help, even if she doesn't say she needs it. Because the normal person doesn't like hearing about, like, people suffering. So, more often than not, people will not vocalize that they're struggling in that moment. It also changes their scale for pain. No, legit, I get scared of that. Because, like, my normal pain throughout the day will be, like, a 1, 2, a 3. Right now, it's at, like, a 1. But, you know, that's normal. I'm always at a fucking 1. But, like... What if, like, I have, like, appendicitis, and I'm like, oh, that's normal. But then I have appendicitis, and I don't know. I get scared. I don't think my chronic pain has ever given me, like, a, like a level 8 or higher. Besides, sometimes, it's weird. Sometimes when I have a coughing fit, like, my, I get a really bad migraine. Like, it literally feels like my head is going to explode. Like, that's when I experience, like, an 8 or a 9, but usually those don't last long. But, like, I have considered, like, signing up for uh, research studies for my condition. I have a... It's a neurological condition. 
So, like, it's related to my spinal cord. And it's rare. So, like, and there's... There's not many research studies that happen for my condition. But I told my doctor, I was like, hey, if there's any local, I'll do it. Because I think there is one going on now, but it's in New York. So, it's, like, all the way across the country for me. But like, I don't talk about my condition often, even though it's like a, a big part of my identity now, like in real life. Because ableism is still very present in like most every society still. That's why like traveling abroad is always kind of like um, an issue potentially for me. Because like in Japan, I really want to go to Japan. But a lot of the city infrastructure is not built for people who need like walking aids. I don't have a walking aid yet, but I might need one by next year. L. But, like, to get to a lot of the shrines or a lot of the attractions, like, there's, like, tens of hundreds of steps, and it's like, ain't no way. Ain't no way I can do that. But the, the, the reason why I don't talk about my condition too much is, like, there's this weird sense of, like, I don't want to be known for that. And... Something that really resonated with me, I was watching an extra Emily stream, and somebody in chat was saying, like, oh, she's, like, so positive, it's so fake. And then other people were like, oh, I just like her vibe, you know, it lifts me up. And I was like, that's true. And I think she says something along the lines of, she's like, why should I be sad on stream when the whole point of it is to, like, for me to have fun and the viewers to have fun? I was like, oh, that's really sweet. So... I try my best not to, like, talk about it, because I know it can bring down a mood sometimes. But if it's irrelevant, I do bring it up. Because a huge thing when it comes to online... Is that it's very easy for people to, like, make their own opinions about you off of very little. It's become a lot more evident from what I've seen with short-form content becoming the main digestible content that people watch online. Like, on YouTube and stuff, too. Because when you give people only a little window of time and information, they can think a million things about you. So, like, I don't want the one thing to be somebody would know me for is being, like, the disabled person. Like, I don't want that to be my main identity to somebody. Thank you. You're very sweet. <laughs> also, it's also something that I can feel personal. Yeah. Um, another reason why, like, I always get kind of, like, concerned whenever there are, like, disabled people like content creators and they put it in their bio like cool we love like representation and being proud of stuff but like if you have a job you don't want your employer to know that you're disabled like you don't want to give anything that could discriminate that's why when i was working i didn't have like um buy pride in my bio or any of that shit i mean good shit because it's very easy for people to find your social media based off of, like, your email or your phone number. Like, that's why, like, if you're looking for work, basically scrape your social media or use, like, a different email or phone number to verify your account. 
Because, like, when you go to, like, Instagram or Facebook, people's recommended friends are based off of their personal contact, contact people on their phone. Like, when I was working management in fast food, like, that's how I found my potential hiree social media. Like, I did not hire the guy that was, like, getting lit every Saturday. It kind of takes out the idea that they're more than their disability. I kind of have that opinion, too. Like, it's different if you're trying to be, like, an advocate and you're trying to raise awareness. Go for it. But, you know, that's not my vibe. I think it'd be different if, like, my condition was, like, treatable or, like, based on, like, medication that required donations. Like, if I had a condition where, like, I needed plasma or blood, then I think it'd make more sense to advocate for that. But mine is just, like, pain and suffering. It's one thing to advocate, and then it's another thing to make your whole personality. Oh, that's an that's interesting. I was gonna like tie into that. I feel indifferent about people who only post about one thing, which could be controversial for me to say because I understand people have a special interest, right? Also, I did score hundred and five on my rads test, so you know what? I have a pass. But. The internet incentivizes you to, like, hyper-focus on one thing. Whether that be, like, what you consume or what you express yourself as. Because, like, algorithms will reward you when you do one thing over and over if it's successful, typically. A counterpoint to that is saying that something is somebody's entire personality is not true. They're only showing you what they want you to see right that's your assumption of what you think they are yeah outside perception is important but what you think in this case what the creator thinks about themselves is far more important than what the general public can think it's an act to extent yeah everybody online is fake as fuck i'll say it now I'm starting drama on the art channel. I'm not real aware. <laughs> no, because, like, I get kind of scared. <laughs> like, what if my viewers are bots? Because, uh, type one if you're a robot, type two if you're a human. Because, like, AI is getting so good. I saw this one article that was saying, like, shit, I don't know what percentage, but it was, like, a, a majority of all content you see online will be air generated within the next five years. Like, nothing will be real. And that can be, like, text, video, photos. Like, when are we going to get to a point where, like, all the Twitch chatters are, like, AI? Can't compute? No! We lost a loyal soldier today. <laughs> but, but, like, what would an AI Twitch chatter even look like? I feel like they would just t type, like, the default Twitch emotes. There are AI bots that randomly write. Like the chat GBT type ones? A friend of mine has one. It copies and pastes from other channels it's in. Wait, no! That's scary! Is that why I get first time chatters that say like random ass shit sometimes? No! We've been infiltrated! 
I think we just need to note the whole chat room. The bot also learns how to add people in chat, so wait, it can have, like, conversations with people? Wait, what if my viewers are all bots? That would be funny, because, like, why would you bot somebody who has less than three viewers in a stream? <laughs> like, I'm lonely, but I don't need help, you know? There are other bots that can chat directly with you if you use a prompt, but it's like asking ChatGPT. I think I've never... Wait, okay, sorry. I retract this statement. I've only used ChatGPT one time, and it was during a stream last year for my graduation stream. This is a YouTube highlight of it. But I used ChatGPT for one day, and I deleted my account after because I got scared. <laughs> but I just asked it to write a... A congratulations speech as like a headmaster of a college and it was like the dumbest shit like i think it's so funny all those ai bots are like trying to sound so much like humans but they're so easy to pinpoint when they're not like a human writing it Too many big words. Yeah, and then, like, they'll also, like, repeat statements and stuff. Like, ChatGPT feels like somebody who's trying to hit the word count on their essay, so they just keep repeating the same shit. Thinking the professor won't notice. I do think it's so scum. How people are using AI for visuals, like art and photography. Like, how... That cannot be protected under American copyright law. There's, like, literally no way that's legal. Like, guys, click follow right now and I'll say thank you. Like, legit. Like, the moment that more legislation passes concerning AI, we're gonna see all AI bots drop off the face of the earth. Kind of like cryptocurrency. Whenever legislation was added so that way people got pa taxed on it, they stopped shilling. There are people that actually protect their craft as AI artists. I know, it's like, bro, you typed a sentence in a robot and you're saying that you made the image? Dumbass bitch. One of my friends, they don't use AI art, but they defend the idea of it and they're like, you know, I don't draw, I can't draw. Like, it's cool for me because then I can make whatever I want. I'm like, but you aren't making it. Like, you're typing a word in a box and it makes a picture for you. Like, you aren't making it. You didn't code this shit. And they're like, but it's cool. But I'm like, it's fascism. <laughs> and then they get mad. <laughs> AR artists be like, I have creative block. Like, dude, get a dictionary. <laughs> dictionary? I think you mean an encyclopedia. Or what's the ones that have the pictures in it? <laughs> to use words? Oh, yeah, because you have to type the shit in to get the picture made. Okay, I get it now.
Are there any, like, genuine real artists who support AI art? I don't know if there are. Because I think if you're a real artist, you understand the danger of it. And, like, how your copyright is being taken every time that somebody uses AI. It's 11.16. We missed 11.11. Make a late wish. I bet there are people who support it for content, like for drama. There's gotta be. Every person I see that defends AI art is a libertarian or like a greasy guy who you know doesn't shower. About two thirds done now. Getting there two hours of time. I've only been carving for like an hour and a half. Makes sense. I've been yapping. Dude, I can't imagine having a stream where I have like a thousand viewers in my chat. It's just like da -da 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 the whole time. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> I think I would lose my mind. That's why, like, for the Twitch front page where they put, like, featured streamers, anybody can apply for that. I think, I do think you have to be at least an affiliate. But if you send Twitch an email and be like, hey, this is my idea, or hey, you're doing, like, a, a POC showcase month, I, I want to opt into that. Like, I've considered submitting, but, like, the, the chatters you get when you're in a front page stream are the worst. They're, like, so fucking annoying. Because they're like normie viewers. They're people who don't know you. Plus, like, I'm not going to give Twitch my good ideas for a free stream. Like, I ain't doing that. I got some ideas, but they gotta pay me for said ideas. What would I even do for a front page stream? Mm. No, I can't leak. <laughs> I do want to relearn how to do caricature again. Because back in 2019, 2020, I was going to apply to a local caricature traveling company. And I sent my portfolio in 2019, but they said they weren't hiring. They said to try again in 2020, and you know what happened in 2020. But I still kind of know the style. I, I just need to, like, refresh on it again.
you have a preferred style for stamps? Um, kind of. I haven't carved in a long time. Like I said, um, this floral series is my first ever original illustration for stamp carving. Because before, my mom would just have me carve, like, other pictures she found on Pinterest. So, like, that's why I don't have, like, pictures of it on social media. Because, like, it's not my artwork. I was fucking 10. I didn't know. But I think the best look for a stamp... Like, if you look at stamps that you see in, like, every day. So, like, they'll have, like, a date stamp where you can change the month and the day. You might see stamps when you do, like, public transit sometimes. Or, like, how back when... Like old passports, instead of getting stickers, you would get like a like a physical stamp whenever you visited a country. If you look at all those stamps that you see in like everyday life, a lot of the time it's um usually just line art. Because if you have a stamp that has a lot of positive space, oh, to explain. This is the demo stamp I made last year, or earlier this year on stream. It's not a replication if you're not aware. Yeah, I I was I didn't know. I was fucking dead. So to explain the concept of positive and negative space, so this is a carving, right? Positive space is anything that would show up on the paper. Negative space is space that would still be blank. I'm inking. Ta-da. So, when you're doing stamping, pieces that have a lot of positive space don't transfer as well. Because see how I ink the stamp pretty evenly, but the spots that have more black aren't, like, fully opaque? Because you have to put a lot more pressure. So... When you're making a stamp design, it's a lot better to do line art because when you do line art, you're carving out like an outline so that way the inside is hollow. So there would be a lot more negative space in your print. It would be less ink used, less space to adhere to the paper. So you usually get a cleaner image whenever you do line art versus a piece that has a lot of positive space in it. To answer the question, what is my preferred style? Line art. Because if you do line art, then you can color it in however you like. And also, you probably would get a cleaner actual print with the ink pad. That's why for this first sketch card series, I'm starting off with the stained glass design. Because it makes sense for it to be line art. Because like, stained glass is made from a is made from smoldering and melting metal between pieces of glass. Also, I personally prefer cleaner styles. I don't like styles that have a lot of texture. So block carving or stamp carving is a lot better for line work and cleaner work. The drawback would be line art equals more difficult? Yes. Because when you do line art designs like this, um, you can see in my first stamp, it's pretty clean. Like, no nicked lines. But you can see some parts, like this stroke, or that line is a lot thicker than this one. And that's just, like, natural variance. Human error. But whenever you do line art, varying line widths do stand out a lot more. Like, the first thing I looked at when I saw this, I was like, oh, this line right here, this line right here for that petal is too thick. But, you know, oh well. And it's also, like, a lot easier to notice whenever you make a nick. A nick meaning a broken line or uneven line. See here in this corner? There's, like, a little nick here where on this line, most likely, I accidentally veered to the left. It's very subtle. Like, if you don't have an artist eye, you probably won't see it at first glance. But it's just natural human error. Line art is harder to... It looks better, but it's a lot difficult to execute well. And I, I think I'm pretty good at carving. I'll say it.
like legit if any point when i'm carving this stamp i accidentally make a nick here or something i would trash it i would just start over because since the whole point of a liner design is the line art and the accuracy in which your lines connect and stuff the wits if there's one nick it would immediately stand out And if your name is Nick in the chat room, I'm sorry, I'm not calling you out. I think the one thing that I forgot so much that I liked about carving is that it's kind of meditative. It's not as like easy flowing as drawing is or painting. Because for every single, I keep on saying stroke, but that's because in my head, stroke equals line. Because like when you work in Photoshop or Adobe, a stroke is what they call the, the, the distance between points you make and also the width of a line. Anyway, whenever you make a, uh, engraving, like every single line you make has to be intentful when you're carving a stamp like you need to like bump up your focus stat also working in the medium of stamps is interesting because it's restrictive in a way because you can't emulate shading or texture like you would with a traditional drawing. Like, you can't have grays, usually. Like, you can still crosshatch. You can still probably execute pointillism. But the only way to get grays is to layer different stamps of different colors on top of each other. I think... Another good comparison for stamp carving is like kind of working with stencils. Like think of a t-shirt design that is just one color. Like you'll see both like the positive and negative space. So like I think if you're good at t-shirt design, like with solid colors, you'd probably be a, you'd probably be good at designing stamps because it's a very similar concept where you only have two colors to work with, positive and negative. I'm using a lot of design terms, and I'm forgetting that I have a STEM chat room. You guys should just, like, start talking about code or something to make me confused. Have I tried to make multi-press stamps with the same design? I haven't yet. You mean like layering different stamps on top of each other? That way, when you look at the final, you get like overlapping colors and lines. I have not done that yet because it takes more material. <laughs> so, like, if I were to do a, a layer design for this, I could do a stamp print where it just fills in the iris with purple... And then you can do another layer where you fill in just the background. But the problem is it takes more material. So I, I do want to do layered ones in the future. Like, I think a really cool stamp design. Because I, I, I have all these different ideas for a series. Or, like, themes for drops. I want to do a stamp where it's, like, this big. Like, probably a 4 by 6 And it's, like, I have a picture of it, but I don't want to show it. Because I don't know if it'll leak. But it's this really picture, really pretty picture I took. It was on my walk. Imagine this. 
it was foliage here, so a tree, and then it was a lamp post, and then a telephone wire with a chrome on it. It had a lot of elements. So you could do a layered stamp where you do the just a solid blue background, layer for clouds, layer for leaves, layer for a lamp post and telephone wire. Like that would be a good layered print because if you used pigmented inks, you could because pigment the pigment ink would show up like paint where it would be opaque. That'd be a good stacked stamp design. I think the hardest thing with doing a layered stamp like that, because I feel like I have a good understanding of like how to layer the colors and like how to carve the image, it would be lining up the actual print. Usually prints that are made like that by layering colors and line work on top of each other are all made of blocks that are the same size. So like if this is your working plane, all the stamps would be that size. That way, when you line it up on your paper, you could just line up the four corners. Or, like, let's say for that idea I had, you would put the foliage, you can probably just carve out a corner piece and line up the corner. Yeah, I think the most difficult thing would be it would take a lot more material. And then also, like, lining up the image. The layered stamp concept is very similar to... What is it called when you print shirts? Like the traditional way of printing on a t-shirt, instead of using vinyls, like where you hot press an image on, you use... Dude, I know what it's called! You use... It's like a stencil, but it's made out of cotton. I know what it's called, it's on the tip of my tongue. But it'd be very similar to that, we're just layering colors on top of each other. I was going to try and see if I could work for a t-shirt print shop that does, like, the traditional t-shirt printing, but none of them are hiring. Because the majority of consumers that get those type of t-shirts are, like, sports teams and shit. Companies who need uniforms. So it's not like you're making fun t-shirts. I think this line I curved. Oh well. You guys won't snitch, right? Are there any shops with a more personal demographic? There are some, but they just don't. Because, like, I've asked some of the workers at, like, local shops in my area, but they don't get a lot of, like, personal commission work. The majority of their clientele will be sports teams, office workers who need, like, an embroidered shirt or some shit. It's because a lot of people who try to make personalized clothing like that are looking to make it for sale and like a local shop who maybe sells maybe a hundred shirts a month would not be able to handle handle like a a multiple thousand unit order screen printing that's what it's called screen printing is where um you use like fabric paint like a special type of paint or an acid wash onto the fabric and the stencil is not made out of plastic it's made out of like woven fibers um it's really interesting screen printing that's what it's called that's why whenever you get a screen printed shirt it looks like the paint is actually in the fabric versus a vinyl t-shirt where it feels kind of plasticky screen printing that's what it's called and a lot of shops don't sell a lot of screen printed t-shirts because it's more expensive to make. It's when they paint up and down the screen. Yes! Yes, sir. So there's just not a huge market for screen printed 
apparel now. But if Peace and Ever sells t-shirts, I will do screen printed. I'll make my own studio. I nicked. You can't really see it. Yeah, you literally can't see it. I nicked this little side here. It's not major. I can patch it. It's like very non-noticeable. I nicked the line right here like a tad. By like a fraction of a millimeter. And look, I fixed it. W. I got too excited talking about screen printing. The benefit to screen printing is that when the color fades, it looks a lot more natural. Like all the colors will fade together versus a vinyl t-shirt where the like plastic ink will kind of crumble off. And also there's like the handcrafted element to like a screen printer. Or screen printed clothing. Almost done. Three quarters. I can't wait to stamp this. It's definitely the most satisfying part. You work on it for hours and then you finally get to see the result. Mm -hmm. I keep yawning. Is the ink regular old ink, or does it have a specific type? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> it depends on like what you want to use it for. Um, the ink I'm using today is Palette Hybrid Ink, all-purpose waterproof. This is just regular dye. Dye is thinner than a pigment ink. 
pigment ink is more opaque because it has like color pigment in it so for this series i'll be using just regular regular all-purpose ink and for embossed ones i would have to use embossing ink the cool thing about doing the rubber stamp is that you can use it with any ink you just have to clean it after because like see this one is stained black because i've only used the black ink on it but like if i use like a blue pigment ink it would be stained blue you just have to make sure you clean it like you can gently like dab it on a paper towel they also have um you can rub it on like a they, they sell these little felt mats where it's like very tiny fibers and you kind of rub it but i'm only going to be using these for um, liquid dye ink i'm not going to be using pigment so i don't need to get a cleaner yet but the inks will not damage your rubber because most inks most art products they sell now are acid free so the rubber should be relatively safe no matter what ink tap you use you can also use a brayer in paint with these stamps you just have to make sure you clean the stamp thoroughly because paint can dry quickly they also have specific paint made for lino printing that doesn't dry super quickly. But since paint is goopy, you have to use a brayer, which is like, imagine like a little rolling pin for your hand. So you, you roll, you roll, I have a brayer, but I don't like using it. It's very inconsistent. Somebody who does do, um, brayer, did I say brayer? I think it's called that a brayer print um emmy beef on twitch she also carves stamps um and she does the brayer method where you roll the brayer in paint roll it over the stamp that way it's smooth the paint is not goopy and then you press it's a lot more advanced than just doing regular ink prints but you usually get a lot more opaque colors because you're working with like specific paints made for um, stamp prints. Now finally for some curved lines. You know, I'll say it, I like curves. For longer curved strokes, I'll be able to move my wrist instead of moving my fingers, so I will, I will have a lot more control. Lean. I'm going to switch to a larger bladed tool for comparison. Because that's a lot of surface area to take out.
linear. Almost done. Wait, I just looked at the stream. Right, almost at three hours. <laughs> oh, when I said I was gonna do three stamps today, I didn't mean three on stream. Just to clarify. <laughs> Shit, that means <laughs> this stamp should have taken me an hour. <laughs> You know, that's the good thing about these lineup prints, is that the price is... Like, the labor cost. Because you can make infinite prints, infinite money glitch. Versus a painting where the pricing is by hour. No nine-hour stream? Dude, I would not. Carving for nine hours? I painted for nine hours once. It was not good. It was very bad. It wasn't on stream, mind you. Okay, I, I thought I nicked a line, but I didn't. I just made it thicker than I wanted. When I used to carve stamps for letterboxing, 
there weren't a lot of kids who carved stamps. All the adults would be super, like, amazed that me, the little 10-year-old, could carve stamps that were better than theirs. Not to diss them, but, like, it was true. There were some carvers who were, like, really detailed. Like, they would use the Zacto blade method and get, like, really fine cross hatches and details. But you would watch them carve, and they would have those big-ass glasses that have, like, five magnifying lenses on them. You know, if I need that to carve, I ain't carving. Almost done. Get ready to spam. You were here, guys. The cover to myself is bad. Oh, also the reason, I know you're new here too, the reason why I have a second channel is because if I did art on the main channel, it would like take my viewership even more. <laughs> we can't be here if none of us are here. Wait, that's so real. I don't look at my viewer count during my stream, so like... The only way I know I have viewers is if I have cheddars. But for my viewer count, I feel like I get decent engagement. Like, most people who watch the stream are chatting for the most part. You know, I'm not saying that I hate the lurkers, but the chatters are a lot more fun. And since, like, even though my main channel is monetized, it's not like I get ad revenue that's significant. So having more viewers is not, like, it doesn't fucking matter. We're here, but we're not real. Stop it with that. You're already talking about AI shit in my chat. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I'm not going to let my intrusive thoughts win. <laughs> but, like, it's so funny, because, like, a lot of small streamers are, like, hyper-focused on their viewer account, but it's, like... It doesn't matter. Like, you're not monetized yet, probably. You're not probably, like... Like, you having five viewers more is not gonna, like, kill or make your channel. Like, everything small streamers should be focusing on is chat engagement. Like, whenever you do have a viewer, know how to engage in a way that is inviting and then entertaining. That's why I will joke and goof and gaff a lot. Granted, I've been streaming for three years, and I don't- I haven't popped off yet. Oh well. <laughs> don't listen to me! <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, um, I feel like I'm really good at engaging. Like, knowing how to engage with a viewer whenever I do have a live chatter. I watch like most small channels. Wait, I mostly watch small channels just to vibe and chat around. I used to be like that, but <laughs> I don't know. I've gotten to a point where like I don't need direct attention anymore. I kind of like the larger streamers where I just type "lol look at W plus one plus two," and I feel like I'm part of the cool club. You know what I mean? But I used to love smaller streams too. Because they feel so much more, like, homey. You know what I mean? But the small... I feel so bad. 
Because the small streamers I used to watch all quit. Like, literally all of them quit. So, I remember seeing this one, like, TikTok talking about, like, how they're, like, a Twitch viewer, they're not a streamer or anything. And they were saying how, like, they can't justify, like, subscribing or watching small streamers anymore. Because they just end up quitting. Or they don't stream enough. Or... They don't like how their chat is dead and how they're the only chatter, but it's like, that's how small streams are like. Oh, well. <laughs> Guys, don't worry. I'll never quit unless I, like, die tragically. Which will not happen, surely. No, you know how you can get, like, your fortune read and they'll tell you when you die? I will never do that shit. Because, like, what if it's, like, real? I know it's not real. I don't, I'm not superstitious at all. Like, at all at all. But, like, what if the one time I do get my fortune read and it's, like, fucking real? Like, that, that would freak me out. <laughs> we making it big, surely. Guys, vote peace in underscore 17 for hidden gem. For the 2024 Stream Awards, can we do it this year? No, oh, but like, imagine. Uh, the Stream Awards is an event hosted by Cutie Cinderella. They've done it three years in a row now. And I think the past two years they had a category reserved for streamers who have less than the partner. Or it's either 75 or 100 viewers. And like... Imagine peace and going up someone who averages three viewers and winning. <laughs> I mean, that would be the definition of a of a hidden gem streamer, right? My only concern would be, like, how am I gonna get down this up the stairs? I, I dead as will trip on the stairs if I win. I'm not even fucking kidding. Stairs are really difficult for me. Peace in 17 or Peace in Art? No, nominate Peace in 17 because Peace in Art does not have enough stream hours. She feel like you beat me in chess, you can't win. No! Imagine she finds that stream. No! No! <laughs> Almost done. Three sections left. No, I didn't like push to get myself nominated last year or the previous year because like I just I, I, I knew I wouldn't win, but, like, I genuinely feel like 2024 has been my year. My YouTube and my other socials have been doing better. I feel like this year has had a lot of banger streams. But it kind of feels like everything is blowing by. Because the issue with live content is that people don't watch it when you're not live. Like, not many people watch VOD content. Um... But I definitely feel like me investing more time into the weekly YouTube edits and the clips and stuff is giving me a lot more insight into what would make an actual live stream entertaining. Because since I'm editing the videos myself, I'm like, okay, like that joke was good. Maybe that joke wasn't good. So that way, whenever I do an actual live stream, I kind of have an idea of, like, what type of commentary is good for an edit. Like, obviously, that doesn't really apply for, like, a gaming stream. But if I'm doing, like, like the Saturday chess stream. Like, I'm going to be editing that stream probably this week or next week. And I already know what parts will be cut out. I already know what parts will be kept in. Like, what jokes or bits that I liked. That's why if you're a small streamer, anybody watching, make edits. You have to edit your own shit. You have to. I promise, because I started streaming in August of 2021. I only started editing my streams in December 2021. And between December 21 and then summer 22, I learned so much. And that's when I started getting more viewers too. And just like the engagement... And the actual live streams are so much more fun after, like, learning how to edit and seeing what does make a stream actually entertaining. The final section, guys. Get ready to spam. You are here. 
I mean, technically it won't be done when I'm done with this section. I have to cut it off the block still, but. All the sections are done. Look at that. We'll see how clean it is whenever we take it off the block. So I successfully carved the tulip with no mistakes. Let's cut it off the block. I got my handy dandy cutting mat. And it's pink, not because I'm girly. It's because my mom bought it and she's girly. I would have gotten a green one. So first, because we already went around the border with the smaller blade. So I'm gonna run the gonna go around the border with the medium blade. Just so I have a bit of extra room whenever I go around with the Zacto blade. Because the width of this cutter that I'm using now is about the same width as the edge of the paper when we transferred the image on here. I was here or was I? Type one if you're a robot. You know, I'm changing my mind. We welcome robots in the chat now. I almost clipped. Oh, wait, tooth. You know how I added the exclamation point clip command? It works, but the only problem is whenever somebody uses that command to make a clip, it shows that I made the clip. So the problem is if somebody makes sus clips or like is clipping bad shit, I don't know who it would be. And in order to get the best top clipper on the main channel, I have to know who made the clip. So, like, the first day that we launched that command, we were, like, I think it was, like, three or four chatters all redeeming the command at the same time. I had no clue who made what clip. So, I think if people are going to use the exclamation point clip command, obviously it's for followers only. But those clips will not count towards the best of comp because I have no idea who made the clip. You know, I could do some internet sleuthing and, like, watch back the VOD, look at the timestamp to see, like, what chatter was active at that time. But it's like, I don't get paid to do that shit. Okay. The border is drawn. Let's cut it off the block. I don't really mind. I just want to clip. Okay, good. Because I felt bad. Okay, let's get this off. Now it's important. When you're cutting this off the block, you keep your tool as straight up as you can. Because if you slice at a diagonal versus straight up, you could slice into your design. If those clips turn out to be the winners, then you give the prize to yourself. W answer! I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to keep that $25 gift card. <laughs> nah, I won Best Clipper last month because none of you fuckers clipped on the main channel last month. I was so upset. June was a banger month. Nobody clipped. SMH.
you made all those Mario Kart clips? Oh, okay. To explain the difference, so the vertical clips like you see on TikTok and Instagram, those are edits that I make. I literally go back and edit every single one of my Mario Kart streams. So the clips you're seeing now on Instagram are from last year, August. I still have like 10 streams to edit in between from August last year to now. The clips that viewers make are featured in my best of compilations. So like best of April, best of June. I think it's like um, my pinned TikTok post and then a pinned on my IG reels too. I'll keep this little nib. But I, I import all my Mario Kart streams into Premiere and then I edit them. The clips that viewers make, I download and then I edit them into the best of comp if I like the clip. So I'm way behind. Yeah, it's so funny because like the clips that I post on both my YouTube channel and like the vertical videos, they're all like old. But isn't that cool? Earlier I was talking about like the importance of like editing your streams. Like, even if the stream is from a year ago, a lot of the topics that I talk about are still kind of relevant, right? 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 Look at that. So clean. I just need to touch up some of the edges with a smaller blade. And then we can try and press. Or try and ink. I think it was a, um, topics be government bad AI taking over. I mean, it wasn't AI popping off last year too. You know, I would never say the government is bad, but I'll just say that there, there are things they could do better, you know, Twitch staff. I think it was a Carl Jacobs stream. Cause I think somebody was asking him. Like, oh, why don't you do YouTube videos? Because, like, Carl Jacob is, like, part of the Mr. Beast crew, right? Like, somebody was asking, why don't you have an editor, like, edit down the live streams that he does? Because usually the streams that Carl Jacobs do is he just, like, plays games with his friends, right? And he was like, there's no real point in editing those specific streams because the best way to enjoy that type of stream is, like, in the moment, like, in the collab. But he was saying, obviously, if you're doing more casual streams or if you're doing, like, a planned stream, you have to edit it down. Because, like, the stream is dead whenever you click stop stream. Like, nobody's going to watch the VOD. Yeah, some will, but, like, it's not going to go viral if you don't edit it. And I was like, damn, that's true. And something that really... Let's start inking this now. Let's try it out. Something that, like, clicked for me was... I was watching YouTube, and I think I discovered Doug Doug like about a year ago now. And so like I'll, I'll sometimes watch an old Doug Doug video. And one came up on my recommended. The thumbnail looked recent. The title looked recent. I watched the whole video, and I was like, damn, the video looks different. Like the overlay is different. The video, like the YouTube video, was from four years ago. And I was like, damn, like this edit, this stream is from over four years ago, and I still got it in my recommended. I still enjoy the video. So, like, as long as the concept is good, people will probably still enjoy it years in the future. That's why I've been spending a lot of time doing weekly edits for YouTube. But yeah. Just looking at this, there's a few parts that I missed, but this is probably going to be a pretty clean print. Advice always say sus stuff. You know, it's really sad. I had an IG reel go viral last week. Right now it's at 100,000 views. I've gotten hate DMs. I've talked about it before. But it's literally me making a your mom joke and an innuendous joke <laughs> at the end. Like, yeah, it was funny. But I'm like, damn, is this my peak? Big reveal. Two and a half hours of work. Okay. Pretty clean. I gotta retouch a little bit, but pretty good. 
I gotta touch up the border on the top. Clean! You can see the line with got thick here. And there's a little nick here. See, that's where like I lifted up my tool and didn't do one stroke. Okay, now I see the parts that I need to touch up. But that's pretty damn good. Two and a half hours of work. If I would have done this off stream, but it would have been an hour. Pretty good. Okay. Now th the nice part. Now that there's ink on the stamp, I can see all the parts that are positive space when I'm carving. So I can more easily see where touch-ups need to be done. This part here where I said it clipped, that was fibers from the paper when I transferred the image. Doesn't it feel weird to touch the grooves? No. My hands are a little bit inked now, though. Oh, you mean like this part? The inside? It feels like, you know the kid who would stab their eraser? And like, make grooves in it with their pencil? It feels like that. I'll have to clean this with alcohol to get all the paper fibers off. But I'll do that offline. Because most of the nicks or the uneven lines are from the paper fibers. I would poke holes, SMH. Did your teacher ever be like, the students who don't fuck up their erasers get a piece of candy at the end of the year? I got so close one year. I was like a month away. No candy for me. Not like I needed the candy anyway. Look at me. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, guys, click follow right now for more uh, queso jokes. You know, I'll say it. I definitely think queso is one of the best streamers. Not because, like, he's a higher viewer count, but, like, queso seems like the nicest guy. And also, he doesn't swear. It's wild. What's the if you don't get smacked joke? I feel like it's a reference, but I don't remember what. Right now I'm touching up the upper corners. Oh, it was not a joke. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, man. When I when was it? I'm gonna look it up. When did they outlaw physical punishment in school in the states? Like I know my mom got the ruler. She went to public school. When was physical discipline illegal in schools? Corporal punishment has been banned in most states, most states, by the mid-1990s. Wait. State where school physical punishment is legal. It can't be legal anywhere. <gasps> it's still legal in three states. Iowa, Maryland, and New Jersey. What?
in some states, they have opt-out policies for teachers. That's, oh my, I thought it was, like, banned nationally. That's crazy. I am okay. I live in America. It's, so like, very America-centrist point of view. But, like, something that, like, really grinds my gears when it comes to America is, I know I have a lot of EU viewers. Just to explain. So, in America, it's composed of 50 states, right? But then because of that, every different state can have their own legislation, like different laws, different, or similar court system, but like obviously different laws and ways of doing things. So what can be legal in state can be illegal in another. As a result of that, depending on what state you were born in and what state you're currently living, it can drastically affect your quality of life. So like if somebody needs um, medical care in one state, but it's outlawed in another, or somebody wants to smoke marijuana it could be legal in another but illegal in a different one so it also affects people's education the textbooks they read so some kid living in washington state could have a drastically different education concerning history compared to somebody in alabama where they're trying to or no where i think it's now required to post like certain religious texts in the classroom Okay, I'm trying to fix this nick. But anyway, how is it fine for, like, some kid to get hit by the ruler in one state but not in the other? That is insane to me. That has rocked my worldview still. Okay, I think we need the Zacto blade here. Dude, I'm just glad. I live in Washington, so, like, one of the west coast states one of the more progressive ones but dude that's not very united yeah it is a huge point of contention in american politics right now but i have the belief that no matter where you live in a country you should have the same quality of life Also, like, access, access to resources as well, too. Because since medical benefits, social security, disability benefits are mainly determined at the state level. Like, I used to be on disability benefits up until a few months ago. So, like, if I would have lived in a different state, I would have gotten jack shit. I probably also wouldn't have medical care. You know, I'm just lucky I had a good spawn point. But it should not come to that. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Not politicians taking that statement and then going, everyone have the same bad quality of life. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what they indirectly say, though. They're like, oh, if there's national policies, then everybody will suffer. And it's like, yeah, but then at least you'd all be like at the same playing field. Obviously, I don't want people to suffer. I, I want them to do good things at the national level.
think I've touched up most of these lines. Something that I did want to test today. I don't think I'll carve another step on stream. I kind of want to just uh, crank them out offline. Not in the fun way. Is just all colors. These are the digital drawings, not the stamps. Don't worry. Do I have a favorite between those flowers? My favorite flower of all time are irises. They bloom typically in my region in May, like mid May. So, like, after my birthday unfortunately but irises i think are really pretty because they have like one of the most textured shaped petals they also look the most kind of like fabric the way the petals fall and i think it's cool because um irises have like the three plumes coming out of it i also like a dragon's breath which is like a whole like the stock, it has like a whole bunch of plumes coming out. Okay, so I know what I'm gonna color like the base flower. I'm gonna use Tombos for the actual like ones for sale. I'm either going to use just marker or I'm gonna do watercolor. I'm debating. I'm debating. So stained glass will typically be red. Blue, yellow, or slight off white, because traditional stained glass is made or current stained glass too, but those are the most common colors back in the early days because um, stained glass is made by heating up glass with metal compounds, and different types of metals will make different colors. So yellow, blue, oh green was also common too. So yellow, blue, green, red, and then off white and clear were the most common colors. So I still want to color the actual flowers, the, the real colors, because modern stained glass, they can make the most any fucking color now. It's pretty cool. But a lot of stained glass now is made by machines. When traditional stained glass is um, hand, I was gonna say hand blown, but mouth blown. <laughs> So the opacity of stained glass colors is characterized by, like, how many times it's been fired, basically, back in the olden days. I'm just testing colors right now. So if it's not perfectly colored, it's fine. Oh, wait. For this one, I wanted to do... Oh, shit. That's so out of the line. I wanted to do light purple for the upper plumes. Just pretend that one's purple. And then dark purple for these plumes. This is just a test color palette. This is not like for real. This is not how I actually color. Unless. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Colors will look a little bit different on camera because I have my, I have like color filters on. I want to do like a darker green here. Um, 
And I think for the background, it'll just be completely a very, very faint yellow. Because traditional stained glass very rarely was clear. It was always slightly yellow because I think it was mostly yellow glass and then they had to treat it to become clear. Right now I'm just trying to figure out what colors I want to use for the border section. So I'm trying to figure out the color that would contrast the most to the yellow. Okay, it looks like shit on camera. Like the color correction is busted. Let's try and turn the color correction off. Yeah, okay, that's a little bit more like reality. Like a little bit brighter. So the primary colors would be bright yellow, bright red, uh like a medium blue. A bright green. So, like, basically the primary colors. Purple stained glass is not common back in the day. Also, the sky blue is fairly common. Because I feel like making the background yellow would contrast the most with most of the colors because rose would be red, tulip pink, daisy white. Oh, you can't see. Daisy white. The reason why I'm doing this on copy paper is so I don't waste ink stamping it and then also waste like my good paper. This is just the color palette. I think it would look best like that. Yeah, I kind of like the yellow. I mean, the yellow looks good against the, what you call it, the iris because yellow and purple are contra contrasting colors. I can't fucking talk. Okay. So it's either I do a blue background, like blue where the yellow is, or I make these larger rectangle borders yellow. That's what I'm thinking right now. I think... Okay, because Daisy would be white and yellow and green. Rose would be red and green. Tulip, pink and green. I think I should make the squares, like the border colors, as similar to the actual flower color. That way it doesn't contrast too much. This border is something you'll see very common in um, modern glasswork. It also wouldn't overpower the color of flower. I agree. I think this palette is nice. I was thinking about like either using yellow on the border, but it'd be too much yellow. Maybe red. No, red would stand out too much. I think this one's a good palette for the iris one. I'll refine like more particular colors near the end, but this is just to get colors in paper. I know I could use any color, but I kind of want to try and use shades that emulate actual glass. Like, orange is also kind of common, but in order to get orange glass, you first have to make yellow glass and then make red glass. Red glass, back in the old days, was one of the hardest to create because in order to make any type of red, like the super bright red, you had to fire it twice. So in order to make orange, you have to make red and then yellow glass. 
I think they later discovered an, an, a metal type that could just make straight up orange. But that's the reason why I'm using these brighter shades. Because these are the ones that actually emulate old school glass art. I mean, besides the besides the like the light lavender. But the primary colors will be actual glass colors. <laughs> See what this orange looks like. That orange is literally the exact color. It's kind of like an embery orange, but a bit more red than yellow. Okay, now for the rose. I kind of want to see if I do a blue here. I think for some of these designs, it would make sense to use a blue background instead of the yellow. This is not how I color real life. I'm just getting colors down, I promise. <laughs> the yellow background would have mixed well with the red. See, that's what I was thinking. Because the reason why the iris one, I think, is the strongest, both design and color palette wise, is because this iris already has the yellow and purple contrast. So using the yellow background already stands out a lot more. And this one, of course, we got to do red. Oh, shit. No, that's right. Now the question is, should I do green or blue? I'll do one half green, one half blue. Because the cool thing about stained glass is that it's supposed to be bold. It's supposed to not look cohesive sometimes. Okay, I'm looking at this. <laughs> I'm looking at this. And the blue looks like too AmeriCorps. Like, if you look at like this. Like, I just like America. Which is not that I... <laughs> it's too patriotic versus the green. Or you know what? Maybe an orange. It's good to be American. Hell yeah, brother. Maybe an orange? I can- I have another printout. I printed out multiple for this reason. I kind of want to see what an orange border would look like. No, I don't- I don't think orange would look good now that I think about it. Because the orange and blue would contrast, and I don't- I don't want the border to contrast with the back. Excuse me, with the background too much. Now that I'm looking at it, I kind of like the blue. Because now, like, the green is too similar. I don't know, what do you think? Do you think the green square border? Or blue? I don't know, I like, I like both, but then I also don't like both.
I like the green. I'm still on the fence. Or you know what? I think it's because it's too much red. Because see how in the iris one, I did the offset color in the corners? I think if I did red in the corners, I think this would... Like red and green, but red in the corners. I'll try that. I think that would look a bit better. Because right now, it's just too much red in the border. Okay, let's try again. Reset. And for this one... Should we, maybe I'll try. I made three sheets of these, so let's try the yellow background. Okay, I kind of hate the yellow. I think it would be too close to the red. I don't color like this, IRL. This isn't IRL. No, I can color. Like, really good. I was really good at coloring. <laughs> Is what I excelled at most in school. Wait, now that I'm looking at the yellow background, I kind of like it. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, no. No, 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 no. If I do the interior yellow and the border blue, then the border looks like America. Ain't no way. Okay, let's try the green versus blue. Okay, okay. Literally America. Okay. I definitely think the red in the corners I like a bit more. Because this year, the red in the center squares is like too much red. Like there's already enough red from the rows. But I, I definitely like the blue interior, yellow exterior. What other colors do you have in mind? I'm thinking about the orange, like alternating red and orange, but I think it would be too warm. Because the reason why the iris one is the best color combo is because you already get the contrast of the purple to the yellow. And then in this one, the only warm color is yellow. Cool colors, purple, green, blue. Versus the rose one, where... It already has the warm color here. So the warm color would contrast against the green stem and the cool blue. So if you want to keep the same concept to the iris one, since you have contrasting in the center, you want the border to be contrasting to the background. So that means your border should be entirely warm colors. Yeah, the, the blue background definitely is better. Because the yellow, I think, is too bright against this one. I think it's because in this one you see more of the actual, like, stem than in the iris one. When this is just the thin stalk and this one has leaves.
you know, this is what concept art is like. You just try a million combos. I kind of want to see what orange looks like. No, 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 no. Because, like, if you do orange, then it's going to contrast against the blue already. Yeah, that, no. No. You want to contrast, but not that much. Maybe just pure yellow? No, the pure yellow is too similar to the faint yellow. I might ponder more about the rose one, but I think the best combo is blue interior, yellow exterior for the big rectangles. And then red corners, green interior squares. Earlier when I said I had three printouts, I lied. I forgot I printed out three, but then earlier I had to cut one up, so I only have two. <laughs> and I can't plug my printer in because I'm streaming. <laughs> yeah, I think what I said earlier, so blue interior, yellow exterior for the large rectangles, red corners, green interior corners, or green interior squares. I think that... I'll play around with more color combos later. But I think that is the best... Because purple would stand out too much. Yellow is too similar to the already light yellow. Okay, next one. Let's do the daisy next. Bright yellow. Now, the daisy's going to be tricky because I could do yellow for the interior, but it already has yellow. I could do light blue. I think light blue would be better because then it would make the daisy center stand out a bit more. Oh, yeah, and then also it would have the yellow border anyway, so that would be a good balancing. Oh, this is a bright yellow. Monk up. Yeah, this looks pleasant. Now I just gotta figure out what color for the tiles. Maybe orange for this one? Orange and red? No, not green. You're getting in the mind of an artist right now. I think red and orange. I'm committing. I think the red and orange would make sense because we wouldn't have a similar problem like we did with the rose. Because basically, the interior colors, blue and green, are all cool. And then, therefore, the border could just be warm colors. Okay, now what should I do? I think red and orange is good. What potentials for those? Because, like, I... I can't do orange or blue, because that would be too contrasting. Red and blue is America. Maybe orange and green. Maybe orange or green? I don't like the orange or green. It's too much green.
What do you guys think? Orange or green? Or red and orange? I'm leaning towards red and orange. Because if you do the red and orange, the border is fully warm colors. And the interior is basically all cool colors. Me too? Okay. Glad we're in agreement. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah. Red and orange. Like I said, if I did orange and blue, that'd be dumb. Be too contrasting. And I don't want to do purple. Purple could have been good to mix with the rose because purple is red and blue. Oh wait, maybe red and purple could have been a good border. No. 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 I don't like that. Okay, the final. It'd be too much green. I agree. I have an art degree. Okay. Now tulip. The tulip will be mostly green because the leaves on this one I made really big. Now I know pink is not a common color. I'll do a softer pink. This one is too, like, magenta-y. Wait, tulips can also be yellow. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. No, if I do... Because I was planning on making the background for this yellow. Because the yellow would stand out a lot more against the green than blue would. Yeah, I think I have to go with pink. Maybe orangey? No, I think the orange would be too similar to the yellow. Tulips can basically be any color. But if I did another red tulip, it would be too similar to the rose one. I'll stay with pink. Reason why I did yellow for the interior for the tulip is because pink is a warmer color. And the majority of the positive space for the interior will be green, so yellow will stand out a lot more versus blue. Now I'm gonna try something crazy. Will these watercolors or markers for the stamps? I'm still thinking about it. Probably, mm, probably watercolor. It depends on like how much fun I want to have. I haven't used watercolors in a long time, but for the most part, the actual coloring in will be solid. There won't be like any shading or anything because stained glass does not have shading. Like if this were actually like shaded, there'd be like a, probably a shadow here, maybe here here but i'm not gonna color like that because that's not how stained glass is stained glass is usually solid glass they do have pattern glass but you're not gonna buy pattern glass that would match the shade or shadows of what you're cutting so it would make sense to either use watercolor or marker because you can get a solid opaque fill with either If I wanted to keep it lower price point, I would use markers, but if I use watercolors, I'd have to bump up the price by like a dollar each probably, because it would take longer to color. Wait, purple's kind of crazy.
I think the purple stands out too much. The purple against the yellow, I don't want that contrast. It'd be a similar issue to here with the orange, but that looks pleasant. I think the blue and green is quite nice. The red and purple is too much. And for the actual coloring, I'm going to use like a soft pink. So kind of like... This, I just grabbed the wrong marker. <laughs> I think the reason why the green and blue is more pleasant is because, similar to the daisy one, you're using warm colors for the border and cool colors for the interior. And then here, same thing, cool colors for the border, when the red is, like, too much. Too much. And then also the... The iris also uses the blue-green. But just reversed. Like, it has blue in the corner versus green in the corner. I think it makes sense to put green in the corner here. Because there's... That way there's more blue, because there's a lot of green in here. Versus this one, where you have blue in the corner and primarily green border. Because there's a lot less green. Maybe I should try the rose with a red and orange border. No. I was going to say, I could just stamp the rose, but I didn't carve the, st the rose yet. I should have printed out another one. Because I feel pretty solid about the daisy with red and orange. Tulip, blue green. Iris, blue green. I'm just going to color the, my extra daisy and pretend it's the rose. Imagine I got commissioned to do this and I submit this for the concept work. This is our rose.
And then I was thinking orange and red. Oh yeah, definitely the warm border compared to the red and green looks a lot better. I just think the red repeating in the border is a bit too much though. I think the red in the corners, that way there's just less red, might help. Yeah, I think red in the corner, so that way there's less. Because in the rose one, the rose is in the top. And keeping the red in the inner quadrants is like too much red. Yeah, I think I'll go with that. Okay. Well, now I have the color palettes decided. Iris colored just like this. Hell yeah. The rose, blue interior, red corners, orange interior squares, daisy, blue interior, yellow border, red corners, orange interior squares, tulip, light pink tulip, green corners, blue interiors. So basically, What's actually really cool about that color palette now is the daisy border will be similar the orange yellow the orange yellow red but the corners will be opposite colors because it'll be a red oh wait <laughs> oh maybe i'll do orange corners for the daisy yeah orange corner for the daisy that way that'll have orange or red corner, orange corner. And then with the iris. Iris and tulip will have the same blue green border, but it'll have blue corners and then green corners. Because I my goal was not to have any of the borders be the same, but I'm fine with the borders being like opposite colors. Or like corresponding colors. I just don't want them to have the same alternation. Okay. Well, I think that was a lot of good progress today. We're four hours in. I did yap for like the first 30 minutes. But I hope you guys learned a bit more about my process. I got one stamp done. Let's look at her again. Man, it's so pretty. Wait, did I mute myself? When did I mute myself? What the fuck? Was I muted this whole time? <laughs> no, okay, you said thanks for yapping. Okay. I think I accidentally muted myself for like, I clicked control Z. What the fuck? Okay, that's the wrong color correction. You were? Okay, <laughs> I think I just accidentally clicked mute for like one second. I scared myself. Okay. Well, that's. Here we go. Okay. Whoa. Oh, I pumped the music up. You're right. Okay, thank you. Dude, I'm just clicking. Imagine I clicked end stream. <laughs> okay. I should not be clicking control Z. Okay, to review today. 
The plan was simple. I carved one stamp. I said I was going to do two. Peace and light. People cried. But we got one stamp done in about two and a half hours. Hour longer than normal, but it's fine. This will be available. The prints will be available on Friday. So I have two stamps done. The iris and the tulip. Oh, okay. And then we also figured out the color palette. And no, this is not how the actual prints will be colored. <laughs> oh, do I not have Joel Pride enabled in this chat room? Uh-oh, I'm gonna get cancelled! I'll add it later. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Any chatter slurkers, thank you for hanging out. Rare art stream. I don't know when I'll be live on this channel again. We'll see. But either way, whenever these prints drop, I'll do a stream on the main channel, Peace and Underscore 17. I previously said I would do it on this channel, but Peace and Light, people cried. I forgot that in order to get to enter the giveaway, you need channel points. So, oh. Make sure you're saving up on points. I'm just like, I'm putting the markers away. Uh, guys, click follow right now, and I'll say thank you. Peace with the art sponsor. Yeah, today's stream is presented to you by peaceandart.myshop.com. If you haven't already, make sure you bookmark my website. It's in the pin chat. Bookmark it now. And go from there. I'm out of points after chess week. Don't worry, I'll make it cheap. I'll make it like uh, 100 points or some shit. Uh, wait. Because you get points when you follow a channel, right? I don't want bozos following just to like enter the giveaway and they don't give a shit about me don't worry if you watch the streams tooth and you have it open you'll get enough points by friday don't worry have no fear you get 300 okay i might make the giveaway worth like 150 points then and if it's for a new follower i'll just ban him <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you guys for watching any chatter suckers hope you guys enjoyed today i hope you learned a little bit about my a little bit more about my process the prints for these two stamps, along with the other two, when I finish carving them, will be available Friday. And I'll do a stream on my main channel on Friday, give away a whole collection. Because the plan is simple. I'm going to sell just the ink print, black and white, ink print colored, where I color it in, and then embossed. We didn't get to emboss today because I'm tired. But embossing is where you use adhesive ink. And then you heat set powder so that way you get like a raised um, plastic print. And then embossed colored. The price point for these will be like 5 to $20 depending on what type of print you get. But I will be selling a bundle set where you can get all four for a discounted price. On Friday, whenever these do drop, I will be doing a stream on the main channel where we'll talk about it. And we'll also do a giveaway for... You can either get the whole, all four of the prints in one giveaway prize, and then gift cards where you can get some store credit, and then you can buy whatever you want from my shop. I just kicked the camera. <laughs> yeah, I did not show feet were good. But thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'm going to work on the other two stamps offline, and then I'll you'll see these on Friday available in the shop. And bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, too. Thanks for hanging out.
Okay. I'll see you guys maybe tomorrow on the main channel. It depends on if I'm tired or not. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to try and finish carving the rest of the stamps today. I should stream. Oh, okay, if I stream tomorrow, it'll be a short stream Mario Kart. So make sure you got noties on the main channel. Or you can follow my Twitter. I usually post on my Twitter like five minutes before I click go live. Yeah, I'll do Mario Kart tomorrow. I'll chat on Mario Kart strip. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm really happy with how my stamps are coming out. I'm, like, genuinely really happy. Okay.